A tu ca ai din cu ce nu s-a And this side of the phone. Good morning. Hi, Alona. Good morning, all. <laughs> How are you? Good, good. Still drinking my first cup of coffee. <laughs> Nice, and thank you for joining. Oh, of course, absolutely. My pleasure, and uh, thank you very much for your inviting me, ladies. Thank you. How is it going, Maria? Um, it's it's going well. It's been a <laughs> it's been a hectic period on my end. Um, I uh, I don't know. Maybe I want to share details with you. Um, but uh, I I um, the the project um, with in startup Macedonia um, successfully. Uh, completed, and I decided to join the cybersecurity sector. Um, so it's still innovation; it's still a startup. But instead of um, I just switch sides. Instead of uh, being part of a supporting organization and a service provider, now I'm part of um, uh, an actual startup. So um, yeah, it's it's going really well. Um, is, it same, is it the same role or? Good morning, Andreas. Hi, Andreas. Um, morning. Um, no, actually, um, I'm, um, well, I mean, within Startup Macedonia, I was a project manager here. I'm um, operational manager. So um, I assist the CEO in um, the development of, of the startup. And we're right there at the very beginning, you know, um, developing the, the services, the, the packages, <laughs> keeping fingers crossed. <laughs> Everything works out well. <laughs> you look like you were enjoying your new job. <laughs> yes, yes. The, the, there are challenges, but, you know, uh, it's just as any, any other startup. Um, it's a learn-as-you-go process, and that's what makes it uh, exciting. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Andreas. Yeah. Hi, sorry, I thought I had my mic on, but it was off. <laughs> How, are How are you all? Good, good. Nice How is it going in Sweden? Yeah, you can see here in the background. This is Lund now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, um, I was thinking um, we should really have this um, kind of a real meeting in the future. We, we, next week, we will start with another group of SIP uh, online. Um, but oh, again online. Yeah, again online, of course, due to the situation. But, but hopefully in the future, we can have a gathering with all the SIP from 19, 20, and 21. So we can... Um, We're be, looking forward to coming please. there. <laughs> <laughs> <Come with us. laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Is hopefully, it... or or we can come down to you as well if that is a flexible <laughs> suggestion. Best, way, best ways work, but first uh, probably we are more like uh, interesting. I don't know, <laughs> so we can't wait down there. Yeah. Especially for me, that Sweden it's considered like my dream country to live. <laughs> Uh, for many years, uh, since I was like a child, I was thinking that yes, Sweden, why not? Just from the in the beginning, I was thinking that it's a good place because of the name. But now that I'm grown up, I can understand more about it. <laughs> but thank you, Andreas, for making time and joining this uh, activity. Yeah, it will be exciting. I'm looking forward to the discussions and the presentations uh, from all the entrepreneurs. Is it as sunny as it is on the backdrop? <laughs> no, it's quite cloudy. We had a very cold spring, unfortunately. So it's um, uh, I'm, I'm a, actually I'm a bit cold where I'm sitting right now because um, the, the, we didn't really get any summer temperatures yet. 
today I think it's around 15 degrees maybe in the in the midday so <clears throat> still waiting for that real summer heat <laughs> We well, have started going in the beach here in <laughs> Romania. Um, yeah, that's why I think I should come down to you <laughs> coming up here. It's too cold. <laughs> no, we have a very nice weather to visit yeah. here. So something we are proud of. <laughs> yeah. Something that you also can make more business out of, I think. Okay, we have four minutes left. Yeah. So we can wait a bit. And drink the morning coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Morning coffee already done. <laughs> the second one. <laughs> we have nice weather here today in Skopje. Mm. But it could rain. Oh, a little rain is not bad. <laughs> anyway, do you have, um, do you know any of the people who are starting the new site program uh, next week? Are there any colleagues of yours or um, uh, acquaintances? Yeah, I, I know one. Um, no, actually two. <laughs> uh, one is from, um, Skopje and um, he's actually um, working for an organization that they're already registered on the ecosystem platform. Um, his name is Igor. Um, mm -hmm. And the other one, um, I actually don't know her personally. Um, I met her husband by another fellowship uh, program. So he informed me that uh, she applied and um, she was a little bit nervous. She didn't know what to do about the, the video. She thought that it was a second interview. I was like, no, no, if, you know, if you've already received the email that you're accepted, then it's just an intro for you know, the group and, and, and the rest of the participants to get to know you. Uh, mm. But she's working on, on a startup um, and they have an SDG element. So it's SDG focused um, startup uh, and it stems from the southwestern part of, of the country. Um, she comes from a smaller um, town called Prilad. Uh, so those are the only two that I, I know. That I have also friends there from Epoca University in Vanilla and I saw I see La Tozzi, if I'm not wrong. They got accepted as well. Yeah, one more. Yeah. So as well. Yeah, we're excited to meet them next week. It uh, will be a, a good opportunity to enlarge the SIPE family and uh, have even more uh, discussions about the uh, innovation ecosystem in the Western Balkans. So hopefully we can all join together also one day to, with all the three groups. That would be brilliant. Um, we have here Her Excellency, the Ambassador of Sweden in Tirana, Mrs. Elsa Haster. Welcome. Thank you so much. You Thank hear you. me? Perfect. Thank you for inviting me. Just checking. We need to see the Swedish flag in the background. <laughs> Good morning and hello to everyone. Good morning, Alcian. Hello, Alcian. Hello. And Hello. good morning to everyone also. Okay, we're going to start in a bit. Maybe just wait for a couple of minutes for the other, or shall we start? Until then, just to have something for Swedish here. <laughs> the flag for our ambassador, for Andreas, and everyone here. 
<laughs> okay, maybe we can start for today. Uh, hi everyone, hi again, good morning. Uh, welcome to Innovation Speak event and thank you for taking your time to join for uh, today. As a way of introduction, my name is Anissa Berisha and I'm working as a project manager at British Embassy in Tirana, uh, running the UK Albania Tech Hub focused for, uh, at strengthening the tech startups in Albania and Western Balkan countries. But today I'm here as an alumni of the Academy for Young Professionals, part of the class of 2020. Uh, I participated in the module of Innovation Ecosystem and Entrepreneurship at Lund University online, but uh, today I'll be serving as your moderator. Before we kick off the event, I wanted to take a few minutes just to go through the today's agenda. Note that we are live streaming this event to an at-home audience so that we listen and have the opportunity to ask questions as well in the chat box. So, Speak Innovation is uh, organized by the alumni of the Academy for Young Professionals and supported by Swedish Institute with the main aim of um, organizing a regional meetup event where all the tech ecosystem of such a small region like Western Balkan could participate, network, discuss and share experiences with each other. The first part is an introductory session with the participation of the representative from Lund University, uh, Mr. Andreas uh, Bringelson, main supporter of the event. And we are very honored to have the presence of Sweden ambassador to Albania, Her Excellency Mrs. Elsa Hastad, uh, who will briefly discuss and present to us the support of Sweden to entrepreneurial ecosystem in Albania and also open for any questions that you might have during the session. Going on with three alumni of the program, part of SIP. SIP is abbreviation for Summer Academy for Young Professionals. Uh, they will share their experiences with us as well. Second part. Second part is considered to be a speaking session, a discussion among the Western Balkans entrepreneurs and the representative from Lund. We are sure, we are sure that it will be a very profitable discussion for the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And the third part is a workshop on how to raise investments delivered by Tanya Koyaka, part of Lund University in Sweden. Uh, we'll go into more details uh, for each of the sessions later on. Now, moving along to our first session, Mr. Andreas Bringelson will give us an overview of the program and the support and opportunities given by the Swedish Institute to Western Balkan countries. He is an experienced uh, project manager with a demonstrated history of working uh, in the professional training and coaching industry, also graduated at Lund University. Uh, well, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Brindelson. Thank you very much, uh, Anissa, for that uh, introduction. And uh, again, uh, very good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm happy to see so many familiar faces here today. And thank you also to Elsa Hostad for joining us from the embassy. Um, uh, and first of all, of course, thank you to the organizers, Anissa, Ersin, uh, Olchon, Elona, for uh, uh, putting us together in this format today. Uh, since, since the SIPE program started in 2019, we have been talking about uh, gathering all the alumni uh, in the future somehow. Uh, we had a plan to do it already last year, but the corona pandemic put a stop to that. But hopefully, maybe next year, we can all gather the the whole SIP alumni for a meeting and also to invite other uh, stakeholders in the regional innovation ecosystem in the Western Balkans. So I thought I would just briefly talk about SIP for those of you who are not familiar with the SIP concept. Uh, so SIP is the Swedish Institute Academy for Young Professionals. And it is uh, supported by the Swedish Institute and carried out by Swedish universities in the Western Balkans, but also in the Eastern partnership countries. And it has been running for about five years. And this module in particular 
uh, when it comes to innovation ecosystems and entrepreneurship. We've been running now for three years. Next year, uh, I mean, next week, we're looking forward to receive uh, the third group also online of this site program. So we'll be starting actually already on Friday, I think, with a little warm up uh, and then kicking off for real uh, next week with the site, third edition of the site program. And part of the site program is not only uh, training and capacity building, it is also an opportunity for alumni to apply for funds to arrange events like this one. Um, so with the intention to not only spread knowledge, but also to share experiences and enhance the networking between young professionals in the Western Balkan countries. So I think this event today is a great example of what we want to see with the site program, not only as a training program, but also as a way of growing our networks and learning from each other. And uh, the site program that we have in Lund is, has a triple helix setup, and we try to uh, put together actors from all uh, of the parts of the innovation system. So we try to, in the program, we try to invite public servants, university staff, but also the private business. Uh, last year, we had a digital study tour of Edeon Science Park in Lund, which was um, uh, one of the highlights of the program. So we try to put together actors from various parts of the innovation ecosystem uh, because this is necessary to reach really good uh, new products and new services. We need to work together as a team, not only uh, working with your own idea in your own office, but also connecting with other people, uh, sharing your ideas, develop, developing your ideas together with other people. So uh, without... Uh, being without too many words i think i will stop there i uh, i'm looking forward today to to hear your experiences and and uh, your activities uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship so thank you very much thank you andreas uh for sharing the information with the others hopefully it i mean it will be helpful for anyone here that hope to have an experience in Sweden or uh, even an exchange visit there. Uh, moving along to, our, along to our next guest, Her Excellency Mrs. Ilsa Hastad, the Sweden ambassador to Albania. As we previously mentioned, since this event is supported by the Swedish Institute, we are very honored to have the presence of Sweden ambassador uh, to Albania, discussing more on the program implemented uh, by Swedish Embassy in Tirana, the impact of pandemic, if any, and a general overview of the current situation or relation among the two countries. Please welcome Mr. Ha uh, Mrs. Hastad. Thank you, Anissa. It's uh, wonderful to see you. Some of you I have met and uh, it's really great to be part of the introduction program. Yes, my name is Elsa Hostad, and yes, I am the Swedish ambassador in Albania uh, soon coming up two years and uh, I love Albania. I think it's uh, fantastic to be here uh, and uh, also because I meet so many people like you who are so interested and, uh, uh, and ambitious and, uh, and it's interesting to talk and meet with you. And I also, I'm also happy to say that we have more and more uh, candidates joining the program from Albania. This was a goal for us. And last year we had more uh, than ever, I think, and this is really good. So I know that you are doing a good job in promoting the program and let's do this together. I will say a few things. I will talk uh, for a few minutes about Swedish innovation, something that you uh, know already a lot about, but still I will tell you a little bit about the challenge fund that Sweden is supporting in Albania. And uh, I will also say a few words about the importance of joining hands between academia and innovation. 
So it is wonderful to be here. And I think that uh, uh, today is a sign that, uh, uh, that innovation is slowly becoming more and more important in Albania. And that is excellent because that is exactly what uh, the economic development in Albania needs. Uh, so, so that is a good sign in itself. And um, uh, in the case of Sweden, innovation is really uh, at the core of the recipe of doing business. And uh, some around the world beat with the help of a pacemaker. And you know that candles are lit with the help of safety matches. And of course, you know that houses are equipped with uh, economical but very practical furniture by the world recognized brand of IKEA. And we depend on Bluetooth to connect our device. This is something that the mayor of Tirana was very impressed when he found out that this was a Swedish innovation. He didn't know, but I guess you know. And then we have uh, millions of lives that have been saved with the help of the three-point seat belt produced by Volvo. But all of this are actually Swedish innovations. And um, all of this Swedish innovation, they have started with one idea and then they've been backed by an enabling environment of uh, uh, growing and scaling up in, and, uh, and to become finally one of the world's leading innovations. And um, in Sweden, of course, we believe in the individual and that this one person and this one idea should be supported. And, uh, and they often come from a wish to, to solve a, a solution, to get a solution to a problem or a challenge that an individual is facing. Uh, so this is the source of every innovation. And I'm sure that, that you have experienced this. Uh, or this is the future, I think you wouldn't be here. And um, I'll mention one thing, because you know that our goal with our funding, being one of the biggest supporter of Albania's EU accession, we work in three directions. It's the environment, and in environment, we have a lot of innovation also when it comes to renewable energy. And then it's economic development, and then it's also human rights, institutions, and democracy. But I will just tell you about the Challenge Fund, and I'm sure that many of you know about this, but we are uh, offering financial and legal support, and we have technical support. And um, at date, we have supported 41 ideas all around Albania, and ideas that have been innovative. And I know that some of you here today also have had this innovative idea, and you've been supported by this program. And we launched it only 2019 um, and we've had the 500 proposals from you know everything agriculture be saffron uh, digital solution business service uh, you name it and um, it's been extremely interesting for us to travel around in Albania because the idea was to support innovative ideas from around the country and and you could get extra score if you had an innovation or an innovative idea outside Tirana and also extra score if it was a female headed business or an, an idea because uh, you've been to Sweden and you know it's a feminist country with a feminist foreign policy that means that we need to think about this in everything we do so that is also a way to promote women entrepreneurship and um, and our idea is to engage as many actors as we can and we also want to connect business community with academia and private sector enterprises and innovation organizations uh, because we also we want to do more than just fund these ideas we want to actually enable an environment where innovation can can bloom and you know grow and be as fantastic as we want it to be and then uh, we know and you know that one of the most important things is 
is to join hands and especially of course uh, with academia because so many great ideas are actually uh, born during research and they come from research and we know that uh, we have a lot of solutions that come from research we can uh, this is not a swedish uh, the couple who were fighting cancer and then uh, uh, they uh, discovered that uh, uh, the research they had made for fighting uh, corona. So this is just one example. And um, uh, we have 41 winners now of the Challenge Fund. And uh, I really encourage you to read more about their stories. Some of them are your stories. And of course, you know that we are great in our social media communication uh, and uh, you, um, uh, we know that there's still much more to do and we want to be part of this and this program uh, where you are the alumni from is is one way of supporting this the challenge fund is another way and uh, we will stay with our project support for at least another seven years because that is the new strategy that we will soon receive from our Swedish government so I hope to be on this journey for many years together with you. And I love questions. So please, if you have any questions, I'm here for you in this introduction part. After that, I have to leave for another meeting. But thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. It was a pleasure to have you with us and listen to such incentives and programs provided by the embassy for our country. We do really hope that it was a good informing speech for our attendees as well. So in the meantime, if there is any question, just feel free to write them in the chat box. The speakers can read them and answer. So if there is not any question, then... Sorry, I think I lost the connection. Okay. Then thank you. Since we have another meeting, we're letting you free. <laughs> thank you again for joining us. Okay, we are having some internet connections problems. Then we can move on with the agenda. A very important part of this event are the alumni of the Academy for Young Professionals. Today we have the participation of three alumni from 2019 and 2020 who will share their experience with us and their current position related to the inter uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. Please welcome Ms. Uh, Mrs. Elona Chera, the coordinator of Startups Incubator and Lecturer at Metropo Metropolitan University. Mr. Ersin Baki, the advisor for internal market and competition uh, in North Macedonia, Secretariat for the European Affairs, and Olton Ruka, the chairman at Sweden Alumni Network Albania. The virtual floor is all yours. Thank you, Anissa, for the presentation, and thank you to all the participants here and accepting our invitation to not join in on this event. The enthusiasm is the same since the beginning of SIA course and until now that we are having this last day event, but hopefully in the future we will have more events and activities and boosting entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem in Albania and in the region also. Um, it was like an amazing opportunity and learning lots of things, especially from me who comes from the academic part. We learned a lot uh, how these models and ecosystems have to work, especially uh, things happen when all the actors join together, education, public uh, institution and also private sector. So to me, it was very important uh, learning new things on uh, this regard. The academic part in Albania, in fact, still have lots of challenges that have uh, to improve, especially adding some entrepreneurship courses or subjects since in high school, at least for the students who graduate, because this is the future and the youngsters 
have to innovate and create to adapt also the environment that is changing every day because of technology and also uh, some other macro factors that all of us may have information about. Um, I don't know uh, if it's important to add any more comments on this, just um, looking forward to your experience with the startups. To me, it was amazing. I wish that we can have more activities and also convince education system in Albania to change a bit traditional ways of uh, teaching and add in some new concepts such as Sweden or other countries and uh, helping the youngsters to innovate, to create and not to stick to traditional things. Thank you very much to all participants and now Ersin can uh, continue with some words. Thank you, Elona. Hi everybody, so I'm Ersin Baki. Uh, from Skopje, North Macedonia, working as the Secretary for European Affairs. I'm coordinating the EU chapters of uh, intellectual property law and uh, enterprise and industrial policy, which two chapters are really connected uh, with the innovation and with the uh, part of entrepreneurship. So uh, in our country, we also work on uh, uh, innovation and, and pro uh, uh, entrepreneurship so we can um, um, do more on, on regional and national wide uh, support of entrepreneurship also and woman entrepreneurship is really mattering here in, in our country we have strategies and uh, we coordinate them with with the institutions so uh, this was a very good opportunity with the SIP. Uh, we can learn more about the triple helix model. We have also started uh, the uh, smart specialization strategy. I hope we, we will gonna start implementing uh, the strategy so we can link the academia, the business sector, and the, all the institutions to, to promote more innovation and entrepreneurship linking with uh, from primary school to high school and universities so people can uh, learn and work on entrepreneurship more uh, in our country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello to everyone. Uh, at first, thank you for this invitation of Innovation Speak. It's really good to be here and uh, seeing so familiar faces also, but new faces that we are interested to, to have a bigger family of Sweden alumni in Albania. Uh, hello to our ambassador that is always in such great activities. And we have, I have to say this, that we have a really good collaboration with the embassy in Tirana. And this is really good for us because they helped us a lot with activities. So thank you. Also, hi to Andreas again, and thank you for all the support you gave us. I have to say that I'm an alumni of SIEB 2019 at Lund University. So we were all time in contact, in touch with Andreas for everything. So it's really good support. Uh, we are a new group, alumni group in Albanian. It's uh, just two years group and we are certified by Swedish Institute. We are in contact always with uh, Albanian alumni also as, as Elona is part of Metropolitan University. And I have to say that is doing a really great job on field of innovation in Albania. So thank you Elona again for this invitation. Thank you, Anissa. I think I know Anissa because Anissa also is doing really good in field of innovation with different companies. So maybe we can meet in the near future with Anissa also. And yes, we are here as a group of Sweden Alumni Network. We are trying to raise awareness to collaborate, as I said, with the institutions, organizations, with civil society, uh, with municipality and different uh, actors in Albania to try to reach something to people and to try to tell people that yes, we can change something and support it, Sweden, support it sustainable development goals it's a really good alternative for us, but also trying to bring really good examples of Sweden in governance, in good governance, in education, in this field that all we know that we need to
to change and to reach something more in Albania also. Trying to know more and to reach more on uh, human rights also that Albania needs mostly. And many other fields that it's really important for us and such climate action, for example. So we tried as a group to reach these fields and to, rain, to raise awareness about this. So thank you again for this invitation. I'm really interested to know more what will happen today. So I will be here all the time if uh, you need to ask something or how to join us. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for your kind presentations. I strongly agree in fact with what you mentioned on the importance of network, the great experience in the program, knowledge gained on the field. I must accept that our cohort was not lucky enough to go in Lund. However, we managed to virtually enjoy all the experience through videos. Uh, well, I should thank all the guests of our first session who were very kind to find the time and join us in this virtual event. I would like to invite you to stay in and enjoy the second part of Innovation Speak, which is a gathering of the tech ecosystem. Uh, we have invited successful entrepreneurs in Western Balkan countries in a discussion showcasing good practices and highlighting the outcomes of digitalization, especially during the pandemic recognizing the tough times through which the economies are going through. A special guest is Mr. Ziad El Awad, who is a lecturer and postdoctoral fellow in business administration in Lund University. Uh, before starting the discussion among the entrepreneurs, Mr. Ziad will give us an overview of the current entrepreneurial ecosystem in Sweden, the best practices, including how the tri triple helix functions, how the practices from a developed country like Sweden can be implemented in Western Balkan countries. So uh, please let me share the virtual stage with Mr. Ziad and please welcome. Good morning morning i just came on time then <laughs> okay so uh can i share my uh, my slides okay just, uh... Uh, can you please allow me to share my slides Uh, I think you should send me a request. I have already, I mean, I'm unable to share. So host disabled. It's not possible to share my, my slides. I can send you if you want. Well, it's just important. a couple of seconds, okay. please. Uh, Ziad, I don't know, we're having a kind of problem with the sharing screen. Maybe you can have a kind of introduction to the attendees while I'm working on this. 
Definitely. Okay. Uh, Anissa, I think uh, if you try to, since you're the host, if you press the three buttons, if you hover over Siad's window, and you see the three dots in the yeah, blue. But I don't know why it is not working. Hmm. You, if you try to make him co-host. Yeah, exactly. Did it change? He's the host now. Okay. I think you are the host now. Yes, I can share. Back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so just uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Is it clear? Thank you. So today I'm going to discuss uh, or talk about entrepreneurial ecosystems and particularly uh, a model that tries to um, incorporate uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems. And this is the model of Triple Helix. So we'll go through some um, history about entrepreneurship first. What do we mean by entrepreneurship? How do we look at it? And then we talk about some of the practices and some of the, of the, of the implications uh, of the Triple Helix model, both within, within the context of Sweden and also the context of uh, the Balkan countries. So I have a more or less a rough agenda today, uh, which I already presented uh, part of it. So uh, how do we view entrepreneurship, entrepreneur ecosystem? What is a triple helix? Triple helix within Sweden and then triple mm -hmm. helix within the EWC, uh, Western Balkan countries. Mm -hmm. When we think about entrepreneurship, we often uh, have this uh, imaginary person, uh, a male or a female, um, um, that we think about as, as a hero. So if we look at these three pictures, we have often think about Thomas Edison of General Electric. We also look at Steve Jobs of Apple, uh, Sarah uh, Blackley of, of uh, Spanx uh, as being really heroic geniuses uh, who really create something out of nothing. And this notion of entrepreneur being a hero is really an institute, I mean, an institutionalized concept that comes from the economic theory of the entrepreneur. And uh, for example, if you look at Richard Cant Cantalone, uh, as well as Schumpeter, which, which comes on, on, the, on, the, on the next slide, uh, they look at the entrepreneur as being an economic agent who really supports um, risk-taking and risks emanating from an erratic functioning of the market. So if we, if we, uh, if we think about, about uh, Schumpeter, who is really well known to many people, um, Schumpeter combined different notions from different prior um, economists, such as Marx, uh, Weber, and also Walras, alongside others. And he was really particularly influenced by the Austrian school of thought, where he uh, uh, thought about an entrepreneur as, as being uh, a superman, basically a man of action, taking pleasure in, 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 um, in, in, in trying to exercise social power and, and really creating change out of, uh, out of the settlement, basically. So um, this view of, of entrepreneurship and particularly the entrepreneur has, uh, I, I, I mean, I would say how would have, have been prevailing uh, for many decades um, uh, in, in, in the literature and in, in how we, we understand economics and how we understand innovation. And therefore, um, a lot of literature that comes beyond this uh, has been really focused on understanding the traits of the entrepreneur. What is an, who is an, an entrepreneur? Can we become entrepreneurs ourselves or not? However, with the emergence of of uh, of uh, of, um, um, of entrepreneurship as a as more of a team sport. And why do I say it's a team sport? I say it's a team sport for many reasons. Um, if you look at entrepreneurship research or at the way it, it is being currently practiced, you can see that the network of the entrepreneur plays a, a key role. Um, and therefore, regardless of the situation an entrepreneur is put in, 
whether it's a large network or whether it's a small network, uh, it's uh, it's uh, um, very advantageous to have a network that an entrepreneur can make use of. So we know a network uh, is very important, and therefore we know that a network it matters for ecosystem research. Why? Because every single person um, confirms that a network which comprises the connection between different actors, such as entrepreneurs such as uh, 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 investors, such as uh, venture capitalists, are very important for obtaining resources and for economic development. Yet, um, examining the history of, of companies nowadays shows that um, the network is, 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 is being more and more important in helping them scaling up the business and improving their ideas. For example, uh, um, um, you have investors, governments, officials, universities, and actors within or around the company that are quite important for the development of the company. I'm really sorry, but I'm, I'm, I'm admitting people because I'm now the host, so I'm <laughs> kind of distracted. So um, these supporters, as I said, they, they include uh, investors, they include government officials, they include universities or other actors and mentors who help really open doors that would otherwise have been not opened or basically closed. So um, uh, these crucial supporters, I mean, very, very, very interestingly, they tend to be located near the founder uh, and are often known as, uh, I mean, to the, to the founder before starting the venture and they actually develop and enlarge during the uh, venture creation process. So these, uh, as I said, uh, actors provide a lot of resources like investment, skilled workers, um, entrepreneurial knowledge uh, that are more easily accessible to the entrepreneur uh, if uh, he or she were located in a distant location. So overall, the, the understanding of entrepreneurship as a team sport is uh, um, bringing in the role of environment, the role of different actors, uh, and, risk, uh, and, and the role of resource acquisition as being very important uh, to work together in order to develop ventures that are successful. And also there is another view that entrepreneurship cannot, cannot be without policies and without the governmental support. And therefore uh, there is a new wave of, of, of literature that wants to understand how the government can really support the entrepreneurial process and how it is being uh, structured. So if we think, I mean, this discussion moving from, from, from entrepreneurship uh, as being thought of as a single uh, or, or as a process that is run by, by a single person into a process that is basically a team, a team sport, uh, brings entrepreneurial ecosystems into, into the forefront of, of our discussion. And therefore, there is a very a uh, nice definition that I chose by, by uh, Spiegel 2020, who discusses entrepreneurship ecosystem as being a set of interdependent actors and factors coordinated in such a way that they enable productive entrepreneurship within a particular territory. And I have highlighted four main key um, concepts within this definition, which is basically interdependent actors and factors coordinated in such a way enable productive entrepreneurship and within a territory. So talking about um, interdependent actors. So an ecosystem research takes a post-heroic view, as we said, uh, of, 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 um, of, of entrepreneurship being a team sport. And therefore it shifts the focus from the founder to the broader environment and, uh, and the organization, of course. As such, the first uh, 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 phrase or the first concept in the ecosystem definition refers to the actors which are involved. And as I said uh, just a while ago, uh, these are entrepreneurs, investors, advisors, government, non-governmental agencies, you name it. Then, um, of course, uh, uh, um, um, we move into, into these actors being coordinated in such a way and an and ecosystem I would like to think of it as more than the sum of its parts. 
So, which means that the operation and the reproduction of an ecosystem depends really on the relationships and their interactions among these actors. So this means that the ecosystem is more than the presence of a, of a single element, such as the financial capital or a university or a government. They all need to interact and coordinate action together. And then we move to the third uh, element of that definition, which is enabling productive I mean, these interactions and coordination needs to lead to something, which is a productive entrepreneurship. And in that sense, productive under, uh, entrepreneurship builds on, on both uh, uh, the entrepreneur, him or herself, as well as the broader society uh, by, in, by, by, uh, um, by the introduction of technologies, development of new knowledge, and reducing barriers to market. So productive entrepreneurship is often associated with high growth firms, which are responsible for job creation. Finally, the, the, the territory, and, and, and I mean, here I, 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 I give you an example of Silicon Valley, Edeon here in Lund, and Medicon Village, and you name it, different places have uh, different uh, ecosystems, um, which are all over the world. But this, uh, this bound, um, I mean, this uh, frame, is basically um, a geographical phenomenon uh, rather than tied to a sector. So basically when we talk about ecosystems, we're not talking about a specific industry or a sector, we are talking about a geographical location uh, or a cluster. Um, and of course, there's a lot of uh, uh, debate on whether we call it a geographical location or a, a cluster and if they are different or they are not, but this is not our discussion. But all I want to pass through in this presentation is that an ecosystem is bound by a geographical location. And this uh, geographical location um, uh, is often governed by certain policies and it uh, encompasses certain initiatives that lead to fundamental differences in how entrepreneurship occurs in that particular uh, region. So having spoken about the um, entrepreneurial ecosystem, and we talk about collaborations, and we talk about uh, uh, you know inter, inter interactions. We cannot detach this discussion from from the notion of knowledge, and therefore we in the in the in in an ecosystem discussion, we 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 often talk about the knowledge economy, and and the knowledge economy just by definition is a system of consumption and production that is based on intellectual capital. So basically it is, uh, it is uh, about the, the, the creation and transfer and, and transference of knowledge. So, um, and, and building a knowledge economy is often, um, 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 is, is um, often associated with the ability to produce that knowledge and the ability to transfer that, that knowledge. And therefore you have, uh, one, two, three, four elements that uh, 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 support a knowledge economy. And one of that is an economic regime, which is associated with governments. And um, so you need to have a set of rules and the set of uh, policies and the institutions to uh, develop or to support or to put in place uh, um, um, uh, the policies that would foster knowledge production and knowledge creation. Then of course you have education and human resources and here universities play a key role in, 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 uh, in, uh, in producing that. And then you also have uh, innovation systems. So here we have pr uh, procedures, processes, tools that facilitate um, and also the technology that would support the creation and the use and the transport and even the storage of information. And uh, uh, finally, the infor information uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, sorry, uh, that was for information systems. Uh, you have the technology and then the information systems is basically having the procedures and having the facilities and having uh, uh, all the, 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 the needed tools to really transport and store the knowledge. So um, having, having really presented all of that, um, academia 
or researchers in general, they try to really capture all of what's happening in one model that can really tell us something about how we go about innovation and to capture all of these interactions and collaborations among these different actors. And therefore, then the, the, the triple helix model emerged and it's based on different uh, uh, helices, basically the government, uh, the academia and the industry, the, how and, and how they are um, located and how they are interacting and how they are collaborating with each other. And therefore, uh, uh, um, a triple helix is a model developed to explain modern trends in innovation. Uh, and um, really, um, we talk about three different elements here the government uh, uh, and the universities, and the third is the industry. So um, uh, an industry basically uh, operates as the center of the production. Uh, the government acts more like the source of uh, the contractual relations uh, that guarantees the stable interaction and the exchange among these different parties. And then universities for sure play a, a key role in uh, as a source of new knowledge and as a source of a new technology. Now, you would ask me, did the role of the university change uh, over time? Yes, of course, we have uh, something that we call a third mission. So universities are moving from being just uh, places where we teach and we do research into places where we, we also think about um, innovating, commercializing these innovations and trying to contribute um, with these innovations uh, so we, we have more interaction with the industry, we have more interaction with the government. We often uh, um, uh, apply for fundings to, to, uh, to, to fund uh, new ideas and to develop new businesses. Um, here I give you uh, quite a, an interesting example. Uh, so this is Lund University. I just captured a number of pictures here so that you can have uh, an idea about the context. So uh, Lund University uh, was one of the universities around the world to, 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 to adopt this third mission. And as you can see, I've just uh, had, uh, I'm basically presenting some of the innovations that uh, have, have been developed here at Lund University. And these innovations come not only as a, as a, a, as a research initiative or just as a knowledge production, but there's a lot in here. So there's a lot of governmental support. There is a lot of uh, connection with the industry. For example, Bluetooth. Not so many people know that Bluetooth has been uh, uh, invented um, here at Lund University together with Ericsson. So you can see this collaboration bet between Ericsson and Lund University's researcher. Uh, and, and of course, there has been probably fun some funding coming either from the industry or from the, from the public sector. Uh, to, to have uh, this, uh, this invention commercialized on a wider scale. You have the facial recognition technology, you have the artificial kidney, you have the modern resp respirator, you have the medical ultrasound, all these inventions have been developed um, here at Lund. Now, I, I, I just want you to watch a small video to but just uh, have a, an overall view of what I was talking about. Lund holds one of the biggest universities in Scandinavia. It's old, it's broad, and it's a tremendous source of knowledge. Things like the artificial kidney, the medical ultrasound, and Bluetooth all started as novel ideas being researched and studied in Lund. But there's also hundreds of other innovations, maybe less famous, but having a great impact in our society. This is what we do at LU Innovation. We help researchers and students to convert ideas and research findings into new methods, services, and products. Technical, medical, and social innovation, we cover all of it. We want to make sure that the knowledge and research findings are put to use, brought into society, making a difference in people's lives. How we do it? Well, we help you to develop your idea into a viable business with funding, patenting, contracts, network, and even building a team. Oh, and of course, it's all freely available for you at Lund University. Sounds interesting? We'd love to hear from you.
So um, having talked about this now, I move also to, to a real case as well, uh, another real case, which is the Saab uh, case. Uh, and like a lot of you um, know that Saab is, uh, is not uh, primarily a, a car manufacturer, but it's, it's mostly a, 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 um, a company that works within the defense sector. So um, <clears throat> thinking about this whole notion of triple helix and thinking about Saab and, and the way Saab is cooperating with the industry and with the government and with also not the industry, but also the universities, um, we know from, from all the indexes that we see now that Sweden is one of the world's most innovative countries. And uh, Triple Helix has been really Sweden's model of innovation, especially in the defense sector, as I said. And why we think about, about uh, uh, Sweden, why the Triple Helix is successful here in Sweden. And one of the major uh, uh, things that, that, that we really uh, try to emphasize is the culture of cooperation and there's a lot of transparency here in the society and it's quite flat and uh, um, not really hierarchical. So that makes it very easy for the country to be innovative. And, and it's not only just that, but all of these elements of being transparent, cooperative, flat are essential components of a successful uh, triple helix um, implementation. And I will come to this uh, a bit later when I discuss the different types of triple helix, helix, helix frameworks that we have uh, as of now. So at the heart of Sweden's triple helix ap approach um, lies an understanding that innovation is very important and essential for uh, national economic growth. So the government, industry, and academia, they, they join forces and they, they coordinate their strategic direction. Uh, so basically we have a lot of programs funding uh, technological developments uh, that are quite important for all. So uh, we have um, interaction um, uh, among these partners and these interactions are quite close and they are overlapping sometimes and they are working together to drive ideas and to spread technologies that uh, um, that generate new formats for the production and the widening of the knowledge base. So uh, why Triple Helix is important and why Saab is really uh, pushing towards that. One of, the main, well, one of the main important elements of applying a Triple Helix is sharing the cost. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a, a big stream of research talking about open innovation and open innovation is one of these you know, the types of, of, or forms of innovations that where the R&D cost is shared among different parties. And this is also a, a quintessential uh, 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 element of, of Triple Helix, uh, where cost is reduced due to the fact that there are different parties uh, collaborating and coordinating and leveraging resources. Um, so, uh, So giving you some examples, uh, Saab created the famous Gripen uh, plane, which is a fighting, uh, which is a fighter. They also created the Global Eye, which is also famous, uh, and the A-26 submarine that goes unnoticed under the water. And these uh, three uh, famous productions of Saab are uh, very complex projects that require the involvement of different parties and different com competencies. Um, another uh, really important uh, 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 frame of reference for us here in Sweden uh, with respect to Triple Helix is the Swedish National um, Aeronautics uh, Research Program, which began in 1994, and uh, it's, it has been going and going until now. Um, and this, uh, this initiative basically involves um, the Swedish armed forces, the Swedish defense material administration, and the uh, Swedish uh, innovation agency, Vinova, uh, and many others. Uh, and they all work together and they, are, they have like uh, strategic innovation programs uh, and they, they share costs and they share R&D uh, practices and they, and they uh, you know, um, obtain Fundings from the government. Uh, so there's something working basically here. 
So another video I'd like you to watch. What is innovation? Innovation is about ideas, but it's much more than that. It's the successful exploitation of new ideas. Innovation is about turning ideas into reality. It's about making things happen and happen at pace. That is why Saab is working to create the Saab Innovation Hub to bring those ideas to life. Saab has been in the UK for over 40 years. The UK is a key strategic partner for Saab. Uh, we have over 970 companies in the UK that make up our supply chain, and over 99% of those are SMEs. We want to join forces with the UK's world-leading scientific and academic skills and combine those with our own experiences and capabilities to produce something that's truly innovative. For Saab, a Swedish company, we find a like-mindedness in the UK. There is a similar mindset. Saab invests about a quarter of its revenue in research and development. At our heart is an innovation philosophy. Saab works with research and development in something called a triple helix which is government, academia, and uh, industry working together. What's so exciting about that, it's not just about creating a situation for a company, but it's about creating a win-win environment and growing the national economy, you could say. Developing innovation uh, normally requires lots and lots of capabilities, and most organizations don't have that all themselves, so they need to collaborate. Imperial College and Saab collaborating uh, will create something awesome because we can work together and bring our collective strength um, at problem solving and at creating the future. White City Campus is a very special and new place to work together. We designed it, taking lessons from all over the world, to create places for academics companies, startups, and government to work together. And we're doing that at scale. We all have a right to security, a right to feel safe in whatever country we live in. Via innovation or through innovation, that is the way we can develop the technologies needed to keep us safe and to keep us secure. That is why the Saab Innovation Hub is so important, both for the UK and for every other country in the world. So, uh, well, as you can see in the video, it's, it's really evident that, uh, that both uh, uh, Saab and, and Imperial College, and as well as the government, both in Sweden and in the UK, they are all cooperating together to create something and you can see that the, the, uh, the people in the video have really emphasized the knowledge factor and, and how important it is to share and to create knowledge among these different parties and that no one party can produce that knowledge alone. And that's the essence and the core of the triple helix model and the, 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 the core of the knowledge economy that I was speaking about. However, um, of course, I mean, I, I, I try to uh, provide you with a, with, a, with a clear picture of what uh, Triple Helix is all about and how it is implemented in Sweden. But also, I mean, this comes also with some problems, uh, um, even here in Sweden and even in, 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 uh, in other countries that are implementing a similar type of model. Um, there's a, and that's probably a personal observe, I mean, observation from my side and from my own research is that innovation is often connected with ICT and with environmental technologies and life science. 
and we often lack uh, 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 other industries or other sectors in, 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 in the innovation process. Second of all, we also know that uh, uh, global actors such as AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Ericsson, to name a few, are the main providers of innovation activities in the region. Um, however, I think that the triple helix um, or the understanding of triple helix and the application of, of uh, that model needs to really start to, inc to, to include even smaller firms to be part of the innovation agenda. Because I think that at least here in Sweden, uh, SMEs play a very important role, at least uh, 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 they, they need to have a share in, in the innovation process. And I'm not saying they are not having, but I think that more, more in that direction should be, should be invested. Uh, and then also we need to expand to other industries, such as, for example, the service industry or even the healthcare, uh, to name a few, uh, to partake in this innovation agenda. Uh, and also, uh, it is it is quite uh, quite fast fascinating that you can see that uh, the triple helix is very much um, mainly in 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 bigger cities like let's say Stockholm, Gothenburg, uh, Malmo, uh, Lund to a certain extent because it's quite near near Malmo. So I think that also triple helix need to start to involve the the other regions that are that are quite uh, smaller but they can together have a, have a much more impact uh, than they are currently uh, given. So to the quite interesting part as well, is that having, having really presented a, a flourishing, uh, a nice uh, uh, image of what a triple helix and how it can be applied, uh, coming to the core of this presentation, I would like to talk a little bit about how the triple helix could be applied in Western Balkan countries and why it is very important to do that. Of course, you all know that uh, in the last round of uh, EU enlargement that was taking place between 2007 and 2013, uh, three major countries uh, were added to the EU, Bulgaria, Romania, and Croatia. The last one I think was uh, Croatia in 2013. And therefore, the EU is starting to shift focus from Southeast Europe towards more the Western Balkan countries, where the future in integration is happening, or is expected at least. However, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the economic potential of the Western Balkan countries, as of now, uh, doesn't really meet the European integration criteria. And therefore, additional efforts are definitely needed uh, in order to develop these countries with respect to their economy, their excellence in research, and technology. Western Balkan countries' competitiveness in the long run is, is at risk if, the, if, if they don't really apply what, what they should apply in order to develop their economy and their innovation strategy. Um, they, they need to increase their ability uh, to absorb and create knowledge. And also, uh, this is mainly because the global economy has shifted uh, the labor intensive uh, uh, industry or uh, uh, from, from, from the Western Balkan countries to the Far East. So basically, uh, um, now there's a lot of, uh, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, tendency to, to outsource uh, services, to outsource the development of technology somewhere else outside the Western Balkan countries and mostly in the far, in the far East due to cheaper labor costs. And therefore this puts uh, Western Balkan countries to a disadvantage because uh, uh, um, without, without having uh, some maybe heavy industries, without having some, technom some outsourcing happening in these countries, the economy will suffer. And one more important, uh, important observation that I did throughout my readings is that there is a low scientific capacities and low R&D uh, investment, uh, and there's absence of cutting edge technologies. And therefore, uh, Western Balkan countries' uh, 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 future uh, orientation towards a more successful economy 
uh, needs to address these weaknesses in order for them to, to, to be able to, to catch up and to be able to be ready to integrate with the EU. So um, at the time um, when, I mean, the history tells us that, that uh, the triple helix was really deemed irrelevant uh, to these countries uh, due to the fact of that the three main elements of the triple helix, the government, the universities, and the industry um, uh, were not really ready. Uh, they were not very well integrated and they were not cooperating properly together. But I mean, it's not really, I mean, it's easily said than, than, than done because we cannot simply just copy paste a triple helix model, let's say from Sweden, and then just plug it in, in a Western Balkan country because um, there, these triple helix models, they work based on some institutional logics. And these institutional logics, they are aligned with the triple helix uh, development. Um, and they are mostly the ones that, that I have actually presented now, they are based on, on, on the West or, or, or what, what they believe uh, is, is a good triple helix model. Uh, however, it's very important to, uh, uh, I mean, try to analyze how specific non-Western institutional logics may facilitate or may uh, challenge the triple helix um, act activities. So if you look at these three different models, we have the uh, statist model, we have the, uh, my, my French is not, uh, is not uh, the best, but I think this is called the la says faire model. And also we have the balanced helix model, uh, and this uh, and this model is basically uh, these are different ways of of looking at the tri you know triple helix, and that's an interesting way because I bring here a, a, an institutional logic into into our understanding of how the different actors can be governed. In the first one, um, the government appears to be in control of everything. And so they control the universities, they, they control the industry, and they take the lead in initiating projects and uh, you know, providing resources and where actors are, are interacting. And there's the very strong boundaries here. And an example of this triple helix, an example of the triple helix model is uh, basically happened in the former Soviet Union. Uh, or Latin America, or even in France. Uh, the next model, where you can see that there is are very strong boundaries among the three. There is some noise. So the government, the university, and the industry in the next model, um, they are separate and they are uh, independent from each other but the actors, they interact only modestly across the strong boundaries. So, uh, yeah. this is, sorry. There's some noise. I'm I think not sure. one person is unmuted. Ned, uh, in case you can mute her, because you are the host now. Okay, uh, sorry, I will uh, re share again uh, okay let me share again just one minute i will i think we i think we can mute uh, uh, okay i'm gonna Sorry, I will, yeah, okay. So do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, yeah. So uh, that model, basically, uh, the one in the middle uh, uh, is very much the case in the US at the moment. Uh, and to some extent in Sweden, uh, but I would say that in Sweden we are much more moving towards the balanced uh, uh, helix model where 
basically here the institutional spheres are quite blurry. So uh, um, there's uh, one strong boundary that encompasses all three different parties together. So we have the government, the industry, and the universities, and and the and the contact. I mean, the the point of contact. I mean, here the contact points here are the ones that are very much important and very much shared. So, but how do we really apply, or how do we uh, try to to think about the models? I mean, if 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 now we want to develop a triple helix that is based on the balanced view of a triple helix in a country that has most probably uh, a more of a state-oriented type of a triple hel helix at best. This means that we need to move uh, in direction towards the right, and that means uh, we need to have uh, a few steps that need to take place. And here I try to identify the different steps that we can that we can really talk about here. And, and step number one is realizing the need. So a triple helix often begins as university or industry or the government enter into a reciprocal relationship with each other. And here in which uh, they attempt to really enhance the performance of, of, the, of the other. And a single organizational sector uh, alone of course, cannot or can no longer respond to the challenges and the and the and the and the uncertainties. Uh, someone is is on the. Can we have all the? Can we have everything muted? Um, I'm really puzzled. Just let me put them all in. I will. I will do that. No problem. Okay, that's fine. Um, sorry for that. So, um, as I said, a single organization or a sector alone can no longer respond to the changes or to the uncertainties unless they, co they cooperate with each other. And in this stage, collaboration among universities, industries, and governments for enhancing the local, uh, the local economy is at the basic level where each actor con con I mean, contributes with their traditional roles. So. If we take the first step, which is realizing the need, so here at this initial step, they just simply uh, understand that we need to collaborate. But here at this very very beginning stage, um, each actor does uh, exactly what they are what they are supposed to do. So universities are doing teaching, universities are doing uh, research only. Government is engaging in policies and industry they're doing whatever what, i mean whatever they do in order to move closer to a triple helix model where there's a lot of cooperation we need to move into the next step which is the intra-organizational transformation mm -hmm. and this uh, this really um uh, uh speaks of 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 uh, of uh, of uh, of a stage where um um we we are talking about assuming the role of the other or taking the role of the other so uh, here universities are more playing the, the, the mission uh, of, of uh, trying to commercialize. So here in, the, in that step, we are talking about um, an actor taking or performing its traditional tax, the tasks, but also taking the role of the other, which, is, which, which I call the secondary activities. Uh, and, but meanwhile, each entity keeps the primary role and there's distinct identity. So um, there's not yet an overlap. For instance, in this stage, as I said, universities engage in business activities such as uh, selling education and research services. Um, companies, for example, from the industry side, they, they, they start engaging more in R&D activities and even establish corporate universities. I give you an example here like Sony, Sony, um, uh, here across the street, they have uh, uh, done a lot of uh, boot camps where they where they uh, create uh, their own um, incubators and they and they attract new ideas where and and they fund them. So that's part of an intra organizational transformation where where they start engaging with other types of activities that uh, brings them closer to the market. Uh, governments. 
also, uh, on the other hand, can provide venture capital money and they also can start new enterprises to promote uh, economic growth. Moving to the third step, um, 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 we are talking here about uh, more of an interaction between organizations in the three sectors. Uh, and um, during this process of taking the role of the other, organizations uh, or like organizational actors in the three sectors have uh, probably respectively realized that uh, engaging in, in, uh, in others' field is a necessary component of, of moving forward. Um, but it's, of course, not a sufficient condition for them to, uh, to achieve the desired goals, which is uh, um, high radical innovations, let's say. So the interorganizational transformation also causes, of course, new challenges and demands uh, within, within, within and across uh, each and every sector. So as a solution, um, um, they need even closer cooperation and interaction with each other. And as such, the third step in the triple helix is really the evolution of, of uh, trilateral interactions among the different parties and the different sectors. Uh, um, and here we have some more interdependencies uh, between these three spirals. So, for example, universities produce knowledge, uh, which cannot be carried out by itself, um, but also uh, needs industry as a partner for uh, uh, the knowledge production. Um, so, moreover, university uh, technology transfer, for example, is dependent on the conditions of the environment that is created by the government. The, the final, uh, the final uh, uh, step in that process is the institutional step. And this institutional step is, uh, is to make things institutionalized or what I like to call routinizing behaviors or routinizing what we, what we think is working best. So um, the, the, the institutionalization means that the activities undertaken by a different by the different actors become more routinized over time. And therefore we, we try to, uh, uh, um, um, to facilitate this, this institutionalization by having two very important institutional logics. Number one is democracy in policymaking where access to market resources and fair competition is achieved. I give you a very uh, nice example here, which is the, uh, uh, the, the Chinese case. In China, most of the companies, uh, uh, like a while ago, they were like mostly state owned. Um, and therefore, uh, in comparison to private Chinese firms, they, they had very less, uh, much more resources from the government because they also had, uh, um, a lot of a lot of connection with with the state, and therefore the entry for private private uh, private companies was extremely hard, uh, due to that the fact that the threshold for private firms was really high, uh, and there were like a lot of red tapes uh, that were introduced by the government. In resolution, uh, new policies in China, for example, were moving more towards putting firms uh, or you know private firms. Uh, moving more like towards the reform where uh, they try to introduce policies that um, equate um, um, private firms with state-owned firms with respect to access to capital, access to resources, and the ability to pursue business activities in different sectors, because that was not the case before. So, Going back to just to sum up uh, uh, the whole uh, presentation and the whole understanding of what do we need to do in order for the Balkan countries to really to, to start thinking a little bit more in the direction of, of, uh, of applying a triple helix model or a model that can help them understand their innovation uh, activities in the long run. First, the basic three tenets of, of, uh, of the triple helix model is the industry, universities, and the government. As of now, the industry in the Western Balkan, they lack entrepreneurship capital. So there is uh, the, the private sector is really detached from the fact that they are not really investing money in promoting entrepreneurship. There is uh, a lot of focus on 
uh, low to medium tech sectors, which means that, uh, uh, as I said before, um, there's a lot of um, um, uh, uh, focus on, 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 on these lower industries that, are, that, that, that do not often result in high impact innovations or radical innovations. And therefore, there is a need for that to happen. And uh, there is a modest innovation and technological capabilities. And, and that is due to the lack of R&D. To solve this, they need to uh, cooperate more with universities. And universities, on their hand, they need to really invest more. Because as of now, there is an underinvestment in research in Western Balkan universities, which needs to be rectified in order for um, uh, the industry to benefit from the knowledge that is being, that is being produced by universities. And then, of course, there we have an outdated research infra infrastructure, which needs to be also uh, uh, in, um, you know, advanced in order for, for the industry to work properly uh, with, uh, with the universities. And then uh, um, the, the government in, or the governments in general in, the web, in, 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 in these countries are, are mostly focusing on uh, promoting entrepreneurship based on the notion of the entrepreneur and less uh, uh, on the entire ecosystem. And, and please don't take my words as being definitive as in being generalized on each and every case, but, but that's, that's mostly uh, uh, what, what the research tells us today, that uh, the economic, um, the, the way the economy is structured is yet very much individualized and therefore you need to, to really take a more, a more of a broader view of what entrepreneurship is all about as, as being a team, um, uh, a team, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, a team process rather than um, uh, a single process. And therefore, multiple actors need to come into play. And there's, of course, lack of cooperation from the side of the government. Uh, uh, the government is really mostly imposing things rather than cooperating. And therefore, if I would categorize the innovation um, um, in in the uh, in the Balkan countries, uh, they are mostly probably in the in the first uh, quadrant of the triple helix. That is more the the state oriented or the status uh, oriented uh, type of triple helix, where the government is mostly in charge, with less cooperation with other with other uh, uh, actors. So finally, uh, I, I would say that interaction uh, is is a key uh, is a key component. And uh, low levels of interaction need to be uplifted. The government needs to, uh, to intervene, uh, not in the sense that they should be overruling uh, the, the, the cooperation uh, or the interaction process, but more trying to foster these interrelationships to a level where they become overlapping rather than uh, having very strong boundaries. Um, I, am, I will stop sharing now. Um, I would like to open some, some I, I have maybe some like five minutes to, to take some questions. Um, so please, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to, to take them um, right now. Thank you, thank you, Professor. It was, I think it was a really helpful, helpful, there is a noise, I guess, but it's okay. Yes, there is noise. <laughs> I'd like to incorporate noise. all of the there information that we had into the discussion with our entrepreneurs, but Fjordi, I guess, had two questions. Shall I read it for you or you can- I, I, can, I can speak for myself, thank you. So hi, Professor, it was a great presentation, really insightful and really helpful. I have uh, two specific questions. Uh, given that we are currently on a digital technological age where physical boundaries are no longer barriers of entry, how is your view of the future of the triple helix model? Will it transcend national barriers, meaning, for example, foreign entrepreneurs with high potential projects and business models easily entering the triple helix model of Sweden or other more developed countries? Yeah, I think a very good uh, question, uh, Fjordi, right? Yeah. Very good question. I really think that this is, this is the future of triple helix. And I really think that uh, this was uh, really uh, a, a a discussion that we took the other day uh, with one of our partners here in Lund, that even this triple helix challenge, we were we were used to certain boundaries being in, in uh, place that 
we can interact with people in the conventional way. Uh, whereas if you if you remember from one of my slides that one of the main elements of a triple helix is the culture, it's the policies in place and how and the structures. And I think that uh, during COVID-19 and, and the, the, the moving into a digital world, um, all of these structures and the way we think about the institution, the institutions that we have and the way we do things and the way we interact are changing. Uh, and therefore, but I think that there are a lot of opportunities in that, uh, in the sense that before, be, before having a digital uh, or before being in the digital era or heavily depending on the digital era as of now, uh, uh, we, we took for granted that uh, in order to access, uh, let's say, the Swedish experience, we have to be in Sweden. Uh, I think that nowadays we have a lot of uh, collaborations with different, uh, with different agencies, with different actors abroad. Uh, and I think, uh, as I said before, it's knowledge, knowledge that needs to be created and knowledge that needs to be transferred. And I think if we emphasize all of us together that this is, this is uh, something that we really need to, to uh, think about when we, when we, uh, um, when we uh, try to implement a triple helix, uh, then working together uh, digitally and, uh, and emphasizing that there needs to be sharing experiences and sharing knowledge is key at the moment uh, uh, um, in, 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 uh, in, in how the triple helix can be implemented. I mean, look at all the companies that have been, have been uh, changing the way they work. Uh, I personally think that companies uh, following COVID-19 will never go back exactly to the way they, they have conducted work. And therefore, uh, uh, since we believe or since we, 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 we saw that, that uh, changing uh, the way we, we, uh, we understand how we can work and, and that there are a lot of opportunities and there's, that there's a lot of cost cutting in in, in, in staying at home or working remotely, um, we are much more able now uh, to think that work could be conducted um, um, uh, from, from, from abroad or, or, or not being located in the same location. And, and many companies have decided that having a physical space is not to conduct work, but, mo but mostly to, to maybe uh, socially gathered once in a, in a while. So I think that with the presence of technologies that we have nowadays and the technology is improving and improving even more and more, um, this will facilitate a lot of knowledge transfer uh, um, among, among uh, different actors. And I think that also being part or close to the EU, the Western Balkan countries, as well as many other countries, um, are in proximity from these well-established systems. And these, is, these systems are actually moving online because the collaborations are taking place online at the moment. So I don't really see, I see more opportunities actually, more accessibility even, uh, that you can, at the finger of, uh, at the tip of your finger, you can just access um, a lot of a lot of knowledge and a lot of resources um, uh, without you know having to really uh, be, be 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 there yeah okay, great I also have a second question yes regarding outsourcing that you were speaking earlier what do you think is the best strategy for a developing country to follow in order to attract foreign companies besides the incentives of lower labor costs and lower taxes? Yes, as I said before, uh, uh, there is a, a model at the moment in the Western Balkan countries that they are investing in low technologies that are really not very attractive for companies uh, for foreign direct investments. And therefore, the, the solution for that is really to start from universities, trying to create uh, uh, incentives to attract uh, research to attract funding from not necessarily, I mean, from the government could be, or from other countries around collaboration, cross country collaborations. You start from the universities because universities are the source of knowledge. 
once you produce knowledge in universities, then you can proceed with the commercialization process where you engage the industry, you engage the government. So that's why I said investment in, in, uh, uh, um, in, in triple helix uh, is extremely important because once you have a good triple helix model, then you are able to attract, uh, I mean, to develop innovations that are more radical rather than just facing, you know, focusing on low, medium end uh, uh, innovations. And then by doing, by, by having foreign, foreign in, uh, I mean, good innovations in, 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 in place, sorry, you can have foreign investments immediately. Um, so it's, it starts from the creation of the knowledge, creation of, of uh, new technologies that can be attractive for foreign investments. Because I mean, you, 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 you have good low cost labor and that's, and that's very attractive, but that's not, but there is actually cheaper labor costs somewhere else. So companies that are thinking about outsourcing, they are heading more towards the far East, yeah. India, China, and you name it. Uh, so the other, or the next step for you, and that also comes at the, at the cost of, of you joining the EU or not, is to elevate the level of um, innovations that are being in, in uh, or that are being produced. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? If there is no other question, maybe we can uh, go on with our agenda. Uh, maybe we can start with Mr. Pleura Dragebi, who is the director of Metropolitan Incubator, given that both of you are coming from an academic perspective and it can be uh, included in the academia actor of Triple Helix model. So after that, we can go on with the industry. Our entrepreneurs can share the real life experiences and how much they find themselves in the Swedish practice that you already mentioned. So. Uh, Mr. Jepin, welcome, and whenever you are ready, you can start. Uh, you are muted. Oh, sorry. Hello, everyone. I'm Teura. I'm the director of Metropolitan Incubator at University of Metropolitan Tirana. Uh, basically, we have uh, startups more than 15 startups that we incubate and we help them to go further on their agenda of business, doing business uh, as a startup. We have also accelerator program and we try to offer the best service that we can to all startups by helping them with grants, funds, applications, uh, donor applications and other financial incentives that are in place in the market. Uh, up to now, we have different uh, different strategy for different companies. We do not have the same strategy for every company. We do customized mentorship. And lately, we organize Startup City 3, which is a festival of business ideas where more than 43 comp uh, startups companies join in our competition. And yesterday, we had uh, final announcements uh, for the best startups of Albania, but they were also from Kosovo participants. So it was surprised that in Albanian ecosystem, we have startups that are starting to flourish in the field of robotics, and especially T-Bot, which was a promising team from Kosovo in Pristina, which was with very young entrepreneurs aged 23, 24 years old who are eager to success in robotics fields and they are very promising investment uh, strategies for potential investors. Also, the second prize that got for uh, Startup City 3, we had a finalist which was with recycling toys, a very uh, upgraded uh, business edge which uh, shared the idea of doing business with recycling and making also comic books for the first time in Albania, a personal uh, initiative who is trying to uh, go further with what 
to do in children markets. And the third place was uh, high-tech technology for green, uh, for uh, green investments in agriculture, where uh, third place was also from Pristina, from Kosovo. And it was about a technology uh, for greenhouses to move the layers of greenhouses and to adjust the temperature automatically through iPhone. These were three promising business ideas that we are incubating. And in the meantime, we give them uh, financial support, if, uh, monetary financial support. For the first price, we, got, we managed to get through our sponsor 2,500 euros. And for the second price, 1,000 euros. And for the third price, we give them mentoring incubation. So these are the latest that we are doing at Metropolitan Incubator. And uh, luckily we have also a finalist at the green business, which is uh, bees farming in Vlora city. And uh, he got shortlisted to present at the green business, which is a social initiative from uh, Dua partners. And uh, what I'm trying to wrap up in what we do in our incubator is that we are not just uh, mentoring, we're advising them how to move forward, how to become fully legalized in terms of judiciary laws that they have to implement for becoming a real startups. We advise them to follow the mentorship program, not just in the first three months, but for the whole year. And I have to mention that Metropolitan do not charge any fees, which means that we are doing for free and this is a uh, very gen big generosity from our owner, uh, Arian Chukai, who opened this incubator for more than three years and who is not charging any startups at the moment. Uh, but we are applying for grants in different projects and that's how we are supporting the startup incubator uh, mentorship program. Uh, now the floor is to you if you have any questions regarding the Metropolitan Incubator. Uh, this is more or less what we do in our ecosystem to boost startups, boost economic development and boost uh, real entrepreneurship initiatives in our ecosystem. Thank any you. questions? Mr. Jeffin, we should accept that you are a big part or a very important actor in our entrepreneurial ecosystem in Albania. I would like to ask, how do you see the future of this ecosystem and what is the work that can be done in behalf of the progress or yes. the development that the government or the institution, other institution can do? Yes, uh, I have to say that I started to lead this uh, business incubation more than a year ago. So when I come in the beginning, it was very poor initiatives for startups. They don't have a clear business mind. They didn't have any real project. But I was surprised after Startup City 3, I can see a big potential for startups to join our incubator and join the ecosystem. But I have to be very clarified that all Startups are looking for grants. Majority that they applied, the main reason that they applied for Startup City 3 at our initiative was mainly for financial support. And what I see in this ecosystem is that government, especially the Ministry of Entrepreneurship or Minister of Finance in our place in Albania, should have uh, more than a million fund or grants which give to the startups ecosystem. That's our advice because uh, a small uh, financial grants can make a big change in startup companies. We had a startup company which two years ago we gave in a startup city two, we gave 1000 euro and they made a big change. They started to buy cameras, they started to do uh, marketing online, uh, digital marketing only through one camera. So only with 1,000 euro, you can make a big change in the startup ecosystem. Now imagine we rise the bar, we rise the standard, and we give them now two prices in financial terms and the third price is, in, third price is incubator. Uh, what I want to say is that grants and financial support is the key. 
and uh, the ecosystem needs to shake the needs to shake in institutional terms and to request uh, all in different lobbying of pressure groups to lobby for bigger grants for huge grants for startup ideas that's my first advice the second advice is that to work close with incubators and accelerators programs because they are the gates which uh, cooperate with startups ecosystem and why not to finance uh, grants and uh, partnership with our ecosystem because we are not the only one uh, incubator in Tirana there are also other incubation offices that operate like Oficina, like Polish University has one, uh, Bartleti, Martin Bartleti University has also incubation program. So now it's picking up the incubation offices uh, for business advice, and it needs to somehow uh, find a agreement with our institutions, with our business units, and grow and flourish in the market. Thank you. Thank you for your time and for joining us today. If you have any other question, please feel free to direct to Mr. Drajebi. Well, uh, I would like to make a question to Mr. Drajebi, even we work together, but in his strategical point of view, I would like to know that how Albanian ecosystem can collaborate or create partnership with the Western Balkan countries, not only, but at least with uh, the region, how to strengthen it and uh, how to make it, um, let's say, uh, how, how to make it to work this ecosystem. What do you think or how we can work on yes. this? Since we have also some partners from or some participants from other countries and probably we can find linkages between us and them. Uh, Yes. Well, the COVID times, the COVID times were very bad for region cooperation, uh, especially in uh, our ecosystem, it was hit very hard. But in the other terms, we are pressured to work more through online meeting systems and to be more e-commerce based in business ideas that we share. My advice is to work close with regional cooperation with different conferences and partnership with memorandum of understanding, especially with uh, different incubator units that are in other parts of Balkans country like North Macedonia, Kosovo, Greece, Italy, Montenegro, Croatia. These are the target markets for Albania that needs to work close in cooperation. But the worst thing is to cooperate and not to have startups in the program. So my advice is, first of all, to grow the startup poll as much as possible, to have high quality startups in every incubation unit, because this is the most important thing. You, it's pointless to do an agreement with international hub in the region if you do not have a qualitative ideas or business initiatives in the startup programs or accelerator programs. So basically when you do a cooperation between countries, you have to offer what's in the agenda of startups that you represent and what are the uh, initiatives that can grow in these terms, like how you can link different startups between the region. So my advice is, first of all, uh, search the best qualitative startup that you have in the city, then in the country, then in the region, and try to link these startups to matchmaking programs. That's my uh, advice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can start with the others. So given the limited time that we have, I'd like to kindly introduce our guests from each country. Uh, we will start with Albania. Uh, Mrs. Elona Kule, who is the founder, co-founder of Graal Albania, and uh, Mr. Fjordi Pernaska, founder of Onus. Uh, 
maybe one of you can start and share your experience. What do you think of the current entrepreneurial ecosystem in Albania? And then we can make a kind of comparison with Sweden practices and the other countries in the region. Uh, we can have a kind of discussion with the other entrepreneurs from the Balkan. But let's start firstly with either one of you, Elona or Fjordi. I Hello. can start if Elona doesn't want to start first. No, I'm here, Fjordi, so... <laughs> welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Elona Kule, and I represent Grand Albania as the co-founder of um, this company. Um, in fact, I would like to share with you our experience. I know that 10 minutes is not very much, but uh, I will make it. Uh, I want to mention the, let's say, the difficulties and the challenges that we faced during the COVID-19, during the pandemic, uh, let's say, period. In the beginning, as all of us, really uh, surprised and very shocked um, the, the fact that everything will be shut down. So we will be in quarantine and it was uh, unexpected for all of us. And me and my colleague from there, it's over. So the business down and everything will be, will be off. But what we did is that we think, we thought about um, a new uh, strategy. Uh, we started to keep our customers engaged in, in our social media, in Instagram and Facebook, just to make open questions, uh, uh, what for, for them right now and what we uh, let's say we discovered was that the customers needed um, let's say product that were missed in the market in, in that moment for example they asked for masks they asked for uh, hands alcohol and uh, all the things that uh, let's say were uh, were missing in that in that period so what we uh, collaborate with uh, um, fabrics with uh, manufacturers that uh, produce these masks and uh, offer them to the customers. Um, uh, let's say that another thing that we thought uh, were to, to ask the customers um, about, to offer the customers about the fitness product, because as they were at home, uh, they were asking product that can do, uh, let's say, uh, activities in their home. So, uh, it, it, at that moment, there were there were a change of buying trends. So from uh, fashion, that Graal was uh, at that moment, everything was changed. The the trend was toward gadgets, toward home products, and fitness products. Um, challenges that that we faced in in that moment uh, were the customer insecurity. In September, uh, there were still discussion that will be a second quarantine and customers were towards saving money, uh, not to spend money. So they started asking for cheaper prices uh, and there were, let's say, a uh, decrease of our uh, online, online sales. I don't know if anything of you has faced uh, these kind of challenges, but uh, I would say that we have, uh, okay, now we are still working and uh, I think that the difficult part is is not um, surpassed, so we still are in difficult ish, in difficult waters. To uh, okay, right now we are asking uh, for investment in order to put the company in another level, in order to uh, offer and to to expand uh, our categories and uh, to optimize our system, our website to offer, let's say, some innovation in, in the market. Um, so, Anissa, this were a little bit, let's say, our experience. I don't know if uh, there is any questions about uh, Graal. Graal, I don't know, but maybe it's better to, to say what we are. Graal is an e-commerce company. Uh, we are a marketplace offering uh, different uh, categories, uh, starting from fashion to to let's say uh, electronic or uh, home products, um, other kind of categories. Also, I must emphasize that the girls are the first one in this market doing these great things. Yeah, providing yes. their service. First, yes, marketplace uh, in Albania, and uh, that is that is why I mentioned before. All let's say. Not all the challenges, but them, and we are still working to to be the first company and to be and to offer 
value to our customer, not only product. This is uh, the issue right now because the, the competition is very strong. During the quarantine days and during the pandemic, uh, there are a lot of online stores that are working uh, only through social media. So they work from home and uh, let's say kind of informality that is still challenging uh, right now. Thank you. Thank you, Ilona. You're Always welcome. Pleasure yeah. to see you. You're welcome. Cool. If I can ask a question. Of course. To Ilona. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I'd like to know if you, since you are operating on e-commerce, you are using only online payments or other kinds of payments since in Albania, credit cards are not used so much on online shopping and those kind of industries because for many for different reasons but first it's not the infrastructure and also the people are not educated with this kind of shopping and yeah. buying and some other reasons so uh, you are only online or you are also offering uh, your products or services we are operating only with cash on delivery and this is one of the challenges that uh, let's say online shopping is facing um, because uh, we, are, we have thought to, let's say, to implement even the payment with cards, but it's very difficult uh, due to the reason that you mentioned before. The customer is not educated. The infra infrastructure is already in place. So this is something that requires a lot of, um, let's say, work, um, education, information about the customer because the customer needs uh, security uh, to, to pay with, uh, with cards. And still, if they buy a small value, let's say uh, 10,000 or uh, 1,000 new legs, he does not uh, find the reason to pay with card that small, that small amount, you know, because he need to go to the bank uh, to open the card, maybe to pay commission there. And it still is something that, um, let's say, needs a lot of work to be done. And even the um, uh, World Bank uh, during the that uh, has done for e-commerce in Albania, this is one of the points that they, are, they let's say they uh, found uh, something and found it as an issue and are working to improve and to implement the payment um, with cards here in Albania. Maybe yes. we have a collaboration with PayPal, so they are still, uh, let's say, finding um, issues and working on that. Uh, in my information, I know even the government is working a bit in the security of the customer when they are buying online because there are so many challenges for them. Sometimes they are not secure on what they are buying. Um, I don't know, uh, just for curiosity now, because um, the e-commerce is something uh, that is becoming more and more interesting and important, in, especially in developing countries as, as Slovenia. I'd like to know if... Uh, from the part of government or public institution, if anyone have made sometimes any any time any focus group or just to know what the businesses think about this topic and how they can manage. So, if the law for this is getting improved or since there is no uh, let's say um, advancement or steps toward them, do you have any kind it's of? Far as far as I know, uh, there is no any law or regulation in place already. We have, um, let's say, organized some meeting with, uh, let's say, uh, Edward Schalzi or our prime minister to, let's say, explain our uh, and all our issues. And uh, as far as I know, they have done a draft about startups and, uh, let's say, uh, some facilitation about uh, the startups. Uh, financial support and other things but nothing in place nothing is in place yet thank you very much Alona, for your You're answers welcome. thank you Alona. welcome anissa uh, let's move to the other guest fjordi the virtual floor is all yours thank you so hi everybody my name is fjordi pernaska and i am the co-founder and ceo of vip Thai, and i also serve as the chairman of onus which are two 3D printing and handcrafting companies, first of their kind, using sustainable materials for the final creations realized. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we faced almost the same challenges as Eliona did because we are the fashion industry and unfortunately it was the one most affected by the pandemic. 
But before the pandemic, we managed to use all our stock materials to produce free face masks and face shields for the hospitals uh, during the first phase. We also managed to switch mostly working online. 90% of our workforce went online. And we also are proud to announce that more than 80% of our workers are females, given that the industry is more oriented in the female sector. And uh, we managed to survive during the pandemic working online. Uh, during the post-pandemic phase, we completely refreshed our strategy. We focused on sustainability more, restructuring our production line in uh, using more than 90% of sustainable materials and technology with a new objective that we managed to set for reaching 100% sustainability for five years. We also uh, focused online, recreating our websites and making them more user-friendly. Uh, we focused on clientele, further nurturing our relationship with our clients because we offer bespoke offerings and our technology lets us to create customized fabrics and products from scratch. So we have a really tight relationship with our clients, they're really intimate in a certain sense regarding their tastes and preferences. And they give us their trust uh, regarding the collection of this information for better service in the future. We also uh, focused on uh, entering new markets and uh, on outsourcing our production, uh, let's say production line, because we have several patents in the regard. Uh, we will be representing Albania in Dubai Expo 2020, which is postponed for this October and will be going on for six consecutive months. We'll be there representing our country with our innovation and with our products regarding sustainability. Uh, this is almost the, let's say, the worst period for all the fashion industry. And everybody has been readdressing their strategies for better, let's say, uh, for a better vision for the future and for the, for the sustainability. Uh, regarding the Albanian entrepreneurial ecosystem, uh, I must say that unfortunately, it is not well developed. There is a huge vacuum regarding the triple helix model that was discussed earlier. Most programs supporting entrepreneurships are not permanent and are temporary, which is also a drawback, a major drawback. We have really interesting programs like the UK Tech Hub, but it is not an ongoing program which doesn't stop. It only happens, let's say, periodically once a year, which is great. But uh, what we need is something more permanent, which will help entrepreneurs here in Albania to further expand and grow in the optimal way. The majority of the programs are mostly led by people with no experience in entrepreneurship. And I think that at least one entrepreneur must be integrated in the leading phase because not for, let's say, for something interesting in terms of leadership, but for more practical know-how in addressing the problems of entrepreneurs and what entrepreneurs face in the industries. It, it will be more practical in my opinion. Uh, they also lack uh, the coordination with angel investors and uh, venture capital. Uh, the programs that are managed here in Albania are too chaotic. And the most, uh, let's say, the most troubling problem, in my opinion, is that there is too much bureaucracy. And the standard competition and funding processes take too long. Uh, we live in a time of serial disruptions, where new industries are created and wiped out in a matter of weeks and months. What is the use of the funding process if it takes years? The time span must be drastically reduced in order for it to be more effective and to help entrepreneurs grow their businesses, which are subject to the serial disruption threatening each industry every coming year. This is what I had to say regarding my line of work and the status, the current status here in Kenya. I'm expecting some questions from the girls here since it is a fashion industry. But it's a joke. Uh, if you have any question for Fjordi, just direct to him. Any question? Um, if, if no one is having a question, I have a question. Uh, usually, most of the time, I'm having a question. I don't know, because of the profession, or, or I found very interesting those startups here, but. 
Uh, Jordi, thank you for your presentation. Um, according to, to the report of Brands 2020, it seems that the industry of fa fashion is uh, led by companies like sportwear, like uh, Nike and Adidas and etc. I just wanted to know uh, what about you, how you manage this kind of corporate competition? Because since people are mostly focused on uh, clothes, that are sport uh, categorized and not so many of the other industries. So how how uh, you manage this situation? And I don't I don't want to use the word itself survive, but I think it was challenging a lot for the other kind of industries here operating in sectors of uh, fashion. Now that is true. It is a survival. So that's the right term to use. Uh, but okay. We mainly, we mainly produce fabrics for other companies. So that is our core product. We have our fabrics, which are made and designed here. They are, let's say, designed in a joint venture with a company that we work in Milan, Italy. And the production is made here in Albania. So we make custom fabrics for different companies. Our core product are accessories, which you mentioned earlier. And it was, let's say, the biggest hit of the crisis. But we had the luck, the good luck and the opportunity to be working with uh, other companies which use our fabrics in different ways, which uh, let us keep up and uh, continue in the market. Thank you, I see. So it was like uh, another, okay. So it's interesting you, because in, in the beginning I thought that you are selling the products directly, but now I see the strategy. Okay, thank you, this was my question. Any other question? Fjordi, if you were to compare the fashion industry in Albania with the other countries that you are operating or selling, do uh, you face any difficulties in terms of the culture or any difference? If yes, how do you overcome it? Yes, we do face a lot of difficulties, but the main difficulty is, uh, let's say, trademark enforcement and the fake, uh, let's say, designer brands that operate here in the country. Unfortunately, the government doesn't support uh, copyright infringement and uh, trademarks. So the market uh, is full of fake designer clothes with uh, really, really low prices, which is a little bit, uh, let's say, difficult for a brand to operate in the market, given that uh, there is uh, such a lack of uh, enforcement. But uh, unfortunately, in my case, <laughs> I haven't been, let's say, limited to the Albanian market, but we have always worked with our partners in Italy uh, to whom we have sold our products. But if it were for the Albanian market, I don't know if I would be now speaking here. So that is, that is a bad thing to say, but it is the reality. And uh, I think that the... So you are saying... Sorry? Sorry, did you say something? No, I'm sorry. Uh, my uh, WhatsApp was calling in the okay. same situation. Okay. So I think the biggest problem regarding the fashion industry, the local fashion industry here, is the copyright enforcement and trademarks and uh, banning the fake products of designer brands, which uh, not only distort the market, but uh, completely overwhelm it in different let's say scenarios. So if this is combined with a direct practical, and I emphasize, I highlight the term practical support for entrepreneurship, which must be quick and quick enough for the industry to emerge and for the entrepreneur to be able to surf the wave that he is trying to get. And so the funding must come in a point where the wave is still high, not when the wave has gone under the water. That's the main problem regarding the bureaucracy here and the programs that I have been, let's say, part of, and the problem that I have been able to, to understand by my own experience. And if these two things are done in a, let's say, parallel way, the market will be much more positive for new entrepreneurs 
and much more potential will be in the table for everyone to grab. Thank you. Maybe we can hear the opinion. Uh, and the can, sorry, just one more question since, uh, can I have time? It's okay with the time? Okay, uh, Ferdi, one more question since you are speaking about brands and marketing. So uh, the situation of Albanian's customers, their awareness about the brands, how it's compared with the other countries in region, yes, but also with other countries, because I think this is a challenge. And how you deal you with this? Do you think that those practical, technical um, practices that we are using on marketing, like digital marketing, are useful for Albanian customers? So, and their behavior? or what marketers can do better, especially young entrepreneurs on this kind of, uh, on this regard, so to manage better and to inform more customers about the brands and their importance and etc. Well, that's an interesting topic. And uh, in our experience, the best marketing channel is word of mouth marketing. And it doesn't, uh, let's say, compare with the other methods of marketing in any way. Uh, because the customer has grown more skeptic of uh, other marketing channels and they are tending to not to trust even celebrities that endorse certain products because what they think from different studies that we have made as a company is that the celebrity is bought from the company and the opinion that the celebrity is giving for the product or the, or the service isn't the real opinion of the celebrity but is what the company wants the celebrity to say. So this is a really negative, uh, let's say, feedback and output from the standard marketing channels. In our experience, given our specific offerings and uh, the capability of the technology that we use, that we offer to the client, let's say, maximum customizability and personalization, we have been able to achieve a certain uh, word of mouth marketing from happy clients, which have uh, referred our brand to other clients. And this is our main way in which we have been able to grow our clientele. But regarding other traditional marketing methods, uh, the results have been mediocre, uh, to say the least. And uh, furthermore, the most important thing to address is not competing with marketing, but competing with what you offer. Because if your only strategy or if your main, main strategy is to compete through marketing, who markets more, who markets better, who makes the better advertisements, etc., the strategy is not solid because it will backfire. If you have a good product, if you have a good service, then it is a matter of time in which your service or your product will enter the market in the best possible way for your customer. Yeah, and, exactly. and, and regarding the brand awareness, the other difficulty uh, here in Albania is that uh, given that the majority of the people and of the customers are, let's say, uh, low net worth individuals, uh, the majority also tends to go to the designer brands, to the fake designer brands that are available massively in the markets in Albania. So the brand awareness is more oriented to big international designers, which have, let's say, expensive pieces of uh, more than $200 per t-shirt or something like that. And they are able to buy the same t-shirt here for $20. So this is the reality of the fashion industry here in Albania. But uh, in our last study before the pandemic, we, understood the new trend for the made in Albania sector of uh, products and services, which is growing, but is growing in a slow pace, not in a big pace. Compared to Bulgaria, for example, Bulgarians uh, locally consume more than 80% of the local consumption is from local brands. Whereas here in Albania, it is less than 10%, something like that. It is really the inverse uh, reality that operates but the trend is increasing and we hope that the customers will be sensibilized in uh, buying more 
products that are made here in Albania, but furthermore, that will be more interested to know the origin of the product in terms not only where is it made, but also the composition of the material, the impact that it has on the environment, how, what will happen with the product if it is thrown away, etc. Uh, thank you, Fjordi. In fact, uh, I would totally agree with your argument that our marketing strategy in Albania is totally, I mean, totally uh, not correct because uh, we are uh, doing very good advertising promotion on Google Ads and CEO Sam and marketing strategies. But the strategy of marketing is not just promoting, it's more than that, it's with the products with the origin of the products, the quality, the added value to the customers. And unfortunately, I think that something else that it's a problem here in Albania is um, economic conditions of the uh, buyers, customers, because I think one of the factors that people are oriented to the fake brands is the fact that their uh, incomes are low. And the other factors is their education about uh, other elements that looking good should have on you, not just wearing, but also some elements that should be considered. But thank you for interesting, and I, I'm really interested on reading your uh, studies, if they are published somewhere, just for general information, because it seems very interesting for customer behavior on regarding the marketing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Uh, maybe we can change the state now and go to North Macedonia uh, and exchange some ideas with, with one of the most enthusiastic person that I have ever met in my life, uh, Maria Dimovska. Um, I'm very happy that I met you during the uh, SAP program, but here we are today. Maybe you can exchange your ideas and experience with the other attendees as well. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. It's already afternoon. Um, so hello, Anissa and Lona and everyone else. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to partake in Innovation Speak. Um, yeah, I've heard the uh, very detailed presentation by uh, Dr. Ziad and it almost made me, uh, I had that sort of mirror experience of when you're being forced to look at yourself and say, okay, this is what the real situation is which I believe that every entrepreneur definitely needs and it's part of that uh, um, um, learn as you go and, and grow, uh, process and, and growth mindset. Um, for, um, in, in order to share a bit, um, some details from the Macedonian ecosystem and where we are with um, um, the uh, building of uh, the ecosystem infrastructure and trying to implement um, segments of the triple helix uh, uh, component or model within uh, the Macedonian startup ecosystem, and from what uh, Professor Rajepi um, shared and, and your two startupreneurs, I would say that Macedonia has achieved certain milestones um, and we have made certain steps forward uh, in the past um, three years. Uh, more, um, those, those steps forward have been exacerbated. Uh, it might be because of COVID as well. Um, and um, one of the one of those uh, significant milestones is actually the development of the first digital data driven ecosystem platform, where we are um, uh, matching uh, startups uh, from various stages uh, that develop different kinds of um, services or products. Uh, so they uh, pertain to different uh, niche sectors with service providers. And when I say service providers, I, uh, I mean institutions and organizations that um, offer different kinds of um, uh, growth services to startups, such as access to finance, access to mentorship, um, and uh, access to new, to new markets. Um, the three accelerators within the country are um, um, also registered and part of uh, um, the platform. Um, in order to um, sort of um, topple down the barrier that exists between the young innovative entrepreneurs in the country and to engage the academia into um, the uh, world of, of startups and um, innovation. 
I mean, Dr. Ziad shared a, a wonderful, he said that the, the universities are the, that vast um, um, resource of, of knowledge. And it's somewhat, uh, I think, um, um, ironic that in, um, and I, I think that this is true, stands true, not just for, for North Macedonia, but also for the Western Balkan countries in general, it's that the academia sort of still persists on doing things at their own pace. And they're not so agile to accept the um, new challenges and new ways of, of thinking that come along with the fourth industrial revolution and the digital transformation. But one of the reasons in order to change this um, picture and in order to change this situation, a couple of years ago, uh, the Macedonian government decided that one of the accelerators, um, Business Ukim Accelerator, needs to be opened right on the premises of the oldest uh, and most established uh, um, university in the country, uh, St. Cyril and Methodius, um, as a way of uh, toppling down, as I said, that barrier between the academia and the young uh, talent that exists and has different kinds of innovative ideas so that they can be both, both merged and then um, each side can, can utilize uh, uh, the existing potential and, and creativity uh, can, be, can be given birth and, and uh, transformed into um, uh, a business idea that can uh, be monetized. Um, the um, currently on, on, on the ecosystem platform, we have over uh, uh, 140 startups and, and uh, um, 51 uh, service growth providers and 63 different services. And, in, and we, we, we designed the, the, the reason why this platform was designed because there was a mismatch. Um, between what the um, what was in offer for the startups in terms of support and the types of support that startups required and, and needed. So um, the platform in itself, in a way, has a, a goal uh, to be that connective tissue among all the ecosystem stakeholders and key players, just as the triple helix model um, uh, plays a role within the Swedish ecosystem. Um, for us, another significant milestone was uh, that for um, there were different kinds of initiatives over the years, but never or hardly ever was there a chance for a startuppreneur, um, such as the ones that you um, have here within your own event, to sit down at the same table of discussion and negotiation with governmental representatives. What was interesting for me to hear from Professor Rajepi was that he said that the availability of, for, of, of grants in Albania for startups is present and it's there, 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 so there is money, the access to finance is available for startups. In Macedonia, as I, I'm trying to, to draw um, um, comparisons and tell you where we are at with uh, our development of, of uh, our ecosystem. Also, there is availability of grants, but we have come to a point where startups have to move from grant obtaining to investments. For that particular reason, um, uh, there is a particular uh, a law drawn um, for uh, business angels so that private investors can be um, legally uh, uh, allowed to invest in several startups at the same time. Because at the moment, um, people who uh, are eager to invest in innovation, who uh, want to help young entrepreneurs um, realize their uh, business idea into market fit products, into market fit services, um, are not allowed by, by law. So at the moment, uh, an amendment is, is uh, being drawn and, and uh, it's um, so as that business angels can uh, invest in several startups at the same time. Um, the, um, also because you, you're, you had a, uh, uh, an entrepreneur who um, has an innovative idea in online shopping. I would like to share um, one of the challenges that uh, e-commerce or the e-commerce sector here in Macedonia has faced throughout COVID. 
Um, the association of e-commerce is one of our service uh, providers, uh, service growth providers on the ecosystem platform, and they have um, developed an instrument that um, caters both to uh, users, to customers, so that they actually um, feel safe while purchasing online because of COVID, we all purchased online. We were all sort of thrust into this new way of living and new lifestyle, but also to give the chance to uh, business entrepreneurs to be registered and to have, uh, um, to offer good quality uh, of, of service to, to uh, the customers and to the users. And one of the ways that they have um, also celebrated successful online um, e-shops is um, via organizing hackathons and events. Um, I think that uh, the, the, the different kinds of meetups, events, workshops are most uh, important uh, segment within any ecosystem. Um, not, um, they're a great uh, way to, to uh, and part of a branding strategy, be that of an incubator, accelerator, um, or even a, a traditional educational institution as vocal proponents of, of innovation. Um, and also they give space to the entrepreneurs to also express their own challenges and struggles. I think that, um, the, the most important um, prop or powerful, I would say, characteristic of the triple helix model is because you have three sides, the government, academia, and the entrepreneurs, where they're coming together, sitting at the say, on, on the same table and discussing and seeing how they can cooperate uh, whilst hearing each other's um, current challenges and issues within each other's spheres. Um, but in order to happen, and just as Dr. Ziad said, you need to have an open dialogue. You need to um, reach out to the other side. And uh, one way of, of uh, doing that uh, in, within the Macedonian ecosystem was uh, throughout the Global Entrepreneurship Week uh, in uh, 2020, uh, which is our winter uh, star startup event. Um, in um, uh, the Macedonian innovation uh, ecosystem, we invited uh, governmental representatives to have a discussion with startups so that the startup preneurs can themselves um, tell them uh, where uh, they struggle the most and what needs to be changed in terms of uh, the legit in terms of legislative reformation so that we create that enabling environment or the conditions are better so that the the path for the startup to grow and reach and transition from one phase to the next is smoother and it's not as steep as it is today um i think that's that's um, <laughs> um all i have uh, uh, to share if uh, on on my side um, most currently, um, um, oh yes, uh, to add, uh, the, the, the Fund of Innovation and, and Technological Development, which is a, a state institution and also a powerful key partner within of the, the, of the ecosystem, they have uh, recently um, initiated two different kinds of packages um, uh, for, uh, that cater to startups and to the development of startups in Macedonia. One is corporate collaboration, where already established corporations are invited to partner with startups so that uh, there can be an exchange or transfer of know-how and knowledge between uh, um, senior uh, and experienced entrepreneurs and corporations to young entrepreneurs. And the second one is the Fab Lab initiative, where they have invited uh, educational institutions so that the academia is yet again awakened from that sleepy dream or hiber uh, hibernation, if you will, um, and gets uh, uh, more um, in touch with uh, the uh, potential that they can uh, and tap into the existing resources that they uh, have uh, within uh, the, the emerging talent of, of uh, the country. I'm open to questions. Maria, I had no doubt it, it was a proper analysis of the whole ecosystem and the proper comparison of the countries. 
Uh, you briefly mentioned about the business angels in North Macedonia. Here in Albania, we do not have a proper group or network of business angel, angel investors. I mean, I mean, there are some incentives to form a group, but still it is not a consolidated one. How does it function in North Macedonia? Right. Um, the Business Angel Club is actually under the auspices of Seed Macedonia, which is a partner organization um, within uh, the startup ecosystem. It's, uh, they also offer uh, a pre-acceleration program to startups, and every trimester they have a pitching event in front of their business angels. What um, because the the ambassador uh, shared that they um, are uh, a feminist country, um, and Sweden is among the first country, if not the first, that gave um, um, women um, rights um, and in in many sectors and, and fields. Um, Macedon in in Macedonia, we have uh, formed um, right one month before COVID actually um, uh, broke out. So that's back in February 2020. We actually uh, the, the same organization saw that there is um, a reason and enough of a reason and enough of an interest to form uh, a business angel club solely for women. So it's founded, established by women, and it caters solely to female entrepreneurs. Why? Because, and I don't want to be misunderstood here, um, the, the, the struggles of female entrepreneurs are same, but at the same time, somewhat different um, with uh, the struggles of, of uh, their male counterparts. Um, and um, what the uh, female business angel clubs uh, is currently doing is that every month and a half they're inviting um, different entrepreneurs, even from uh, the traditional sector as well, via uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, via different uh, business associations, so they can actually um, get acquainted with the opportunities that exist um, within the startup ecosystem and um, be uh, involved as mentors, but also should they feel and should they want also be involved as investors to uh, the innovative startups within the country. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Maria. Then we can move from North Macedonia to Serbia. Lazar Gucic. Sorry for the pronunci uh, pronunciation of the surnames, but I hope I'm not wrong. Uh, no Lazar is an entrepreneur from Serbia, co-founder of LEC Development, but he can provide to us more information about his startup and his relation with Albania. He has been here for a long period of time, maybe six months, I guess. But yeah, Lazar. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to, to share some experience and my insight into the Balkan entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem. Uh, yes, I have been a part of uh, UK Tech Hub program and, and, and it was a great experience to uh, make uh, personal network wider and to open some new chances for, for the businesses. Uh, since uh, both of the projects that uh, I, I have a part in are, one is international and uh, working in the Asian market. And the uh, second one is uh, focused on entire Balkan. I would speak about the situation in general for, for the Balkans, because in the end, um, I agree about most things with Fjordi. And uh, I, like, I love to say that all of us on Balkans are in the same uh, situation. <laughs> so, so we all uh, struggle same difficulties. And though some of those are access to funds, uh, chances for additional revenue streams, both for our businesses or privately, everything is very poor. So um, if we decide to start uh, anything, um, it is important to realize that for us here on Balkans, it will probably be five times harder than if we are in developed countries in EU, USA, or even the, the Asian countries. So knowing these facts, um, we need to choose to fight all these circumstances and, and to strongly believe in our ideas and products so we are ready to sacrifice for, for a bigger success. 
uh, I, I would like to use one quote uh, that that uh, probably every startup and entrepreneur can uh, relate to. So uh, the level of success here for us on Balkans is uh, directly proportional to how much we are willing to sacrifice. So uh, definitely, I think everything is possible. Everything is achievable, even if we are in Serbia, Macedonia, Bulgaria, Albania, Kosovo, anywhere. But uh, we need to accept all of the facts and, uh, and that it is very hard to access to, to many things. So if we precisely uh, talk about COVID and how did it affect the businesses, definitely some of the companies were affected very hard and some of them were basically destroyed by, by the situation, but some of them uh, went out stronger than it, they were before by transforming their businesses into different models, changed their marketing strategy, uh, changed their uh, business models by working more remotely than, than office-based. So in the end, some of the businesses scaled. Um, if I'm to share the experience about the ELSD, which is uh, basically the first online language school originating from Europe, from Balkans, that is 100% ours here, meaning that we do not have uh, like a Chinese, Japanese uh, equity partner. Uh, it's definitely one of, the, one of a kind business and it is in ad tech industry. So uh, COVID for ELSD was actually just another virus that, that, uh, that we needed to, to fight with in order to survive. And again, the thing that you already said, yeah, all of us who have experience in, in building something operationally from scratch, the, the, the term survival is actually very uh, common for all of us. So, Aside of COVID, ELSD for the last two years was, was fighting with all of the circumstances, with uh, lack of funds, lack of budgets, uh, and lack, for, uh, lack of the money for marketing and sales activities. Because we were doing business in China the mostly, started in Japan, but moved to China. And we were fighting competitors in the industry with millions in a budget. And we started from scratch. So basically our entire business was a uh, growth hacking model based and we needed to scale by doing things that other people wouldn't do and the normal entrepreneurs wouldn't do. So um, aside of the investment we raised in the early stage, uh, all of our uh, budget went to the overhead cost and we uh, had to cover our staff and to cover the part of the business that will make an offer for the market. In our case, those, it is the offer of available classes to the students that, that will join our platform. So um, when February 2020 came and COVID happened, uh, a month before that, we signed a few big deals in, with Chinese private institutions, schools, for providing them uh, language services and for providing them uh, the service on our uh, platform. And then uh, quarantine happened in China. All of the deals were dead. Uh, we lost uh, our clients and uh, they basically decided to, uh, how to say, how to say, to invest only in the public educa education and not to pay the uh, expensive online courses. So this was a moment in the startup where I had to make a decision to quit or to uh, keep, uh, keep working. And uh, the quitting was never an option. So we decided to, to keep struggling. And then after one month, two months, three months, four months of being in a survival mode and finding money to cover basic costs, we uh, started to transform the business model. While being focused on the Chinese market, we started uh, providing uh, services to B2B part of the business and to the companies based in Serbia, based on Balkans. This helped us make the, the money moving and uh, to keep us on a low volume break even until the beginning of this year where, where we actually signed some big deals. 
and then the, the, the dice changed. So uh, basically my advice is, like I said, you have to choose for yourself how much are you willing to sacrifice, how much are you willing to work and to fight many no's because until you make a successful deal and close some, some business, you, you, you have to fight all the circumstances that we uh, have on Balkans. Uh, we'll use a minute to, to, to cover uh, a second uh, business that I'm involved. It's uh, actually connected with, with ELSD in a matter of a workforce. So it is a platform for uh, recruitment and basically a digital HR agency that will connect all the countries in the mini Schengen zone and on Balkans. So the goal is to, to, to enable recruitment and workforce without boundaries on, on Balkans. So for the end, my, my advice for every entrepreneur or start offer is in, uh, to decide are they willing not to quit and not to listen to many advices from VC managers, from different coaches and not to uh, receive personally any question they are uh, they, they're asked from those people who do not have uh, businesses in their background, who do not have experience in forming a business or real struggle, struggle behind them. So in short, that, that's my story. And if there are any questions, please. Thank you, Lazar. In fact, it was a very good story to share and to demonstrate to all the others that being an entrepreneur is all about consistency and persistence in order to be successful. Uh, I don't know if any of you have any question. Um, thank you, Lazar, for uh, your presentation. Uh, um, I'm just, I was checking on the internet, but I think it's not the right startup that I'm asking. So. Uh, do you have any website or app for uh, this startup? Um, I will share in the chat box, okay? It's multilingual, so the, 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 the home page is in Chinese. In Chinese, so that's the, the correct one, yes. Yeah, yeah so uh, it's okay. the English version. And uh, just to understand more your role, you are like... Um, how to say they are sourcing this service to you or franchising or you are helping this uh, business uh, to expand their network i'm i'm not uh, very sure on your role here the product that you are seeing is our um, fully uh, unique built portal and web platform from scratch and it's a software that enables us to connect students from all over the world with teachers that we recruit and that are independent contractors. That's so basically we cover the entire spectrum of, of the business and the, the, the service that we are providing to the Asian market. Okay, well, that's perfect, in fact, because what we have seen in Urbina is that those education platforms and startups are not working very well, probably because of the de demand from the market or other reasons, I don't know. In times of COVID, when started the pandemic situation, quarantine, we have many hackathons organized and uh, developing such kinds of startups with a focus on education, but none of them have a successful story, at least in my opinion, in my knowledge. So this is perfect what you have done here. Sorry for interrupting you because uh, the, the, the biggest challenge is when you want to start ed tech uh, business and work internationally, the biggest uh, wrong assumption that you have are is, is the money that you need for this business. And actually you need a lot to be competitive on any other market and you realize that very late because your belief in idea is that you're awesome you're great and everything but you're fighting with with billion dollar companies so you need how did you manage uh the, the, <laughs> that, that that that's a hard story but 
small step by small step. Uh, first, uh, I gave a part of the equity to one partner who took technology on them and provided us a bigger network of potential investors. Then uh, Manpower Group uh, joined the, the equity and gave us some sponsorship because they saw the passion and the potential. And it's very hard to find someone who sees the potential in a business that you are running in, in the Asian market. And after that, it was all about growth hacking. We never had money for big marketing, for sales activities. So in the end, we partner up with Chinese Chinese uh, corporation. And now the things are scaling really nice. Yeah, I see. They're interesting. In fact, that's true. Uh, I have heard from some entrepreneurs that they don't believe on angel investors or sometimes they can't manage their contracts. I don't know how it's in your case, but uh, uh, because sometimes those are not seen as good collaboration opportunities. Definitely, definitely. The, for, for Balkan countries, those kind of things, angel investors and so on are like uh, unicorns, <laughs> very hard to find. So I had luck to, 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 to find a friend that uh, put his beliefs in the business and, and is owning a huge IT company. So for him, it was not a big expense to take the technology and to develop the, 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 the software, to keep developing the software because it was already developed. And then uh, it is also the private contact that enabled us to be sponsored by Manpower. So basically, no angels, no VCs that are doing hard due diligence processing, but uh, simple handshaking and the belief in the product. So it was yes. a struggle, 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 and then some luck happens. And we, we are now aiming to make bigger results. Well, congratulations on your initiatives. Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, Elona, for always having questions. <laughs> uh, and thank you, Lester, for your time and for joining us. Um, maybe we can switch to uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have two attendees from this state. Uh, Erna Sosevic and Nedim, I cannot pronounce this kind of surname. Could you please help me? Uh, it's Tarakcia. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, either one of you can maybe uh, start and share your experience in your country and have a kind of discussion with the others. I don't yes. mind starting. Okay. So. If, if Erna is here, she should have the advantage because she's the lady, but... Yeah, I am here. <laughs> you are here. I sorry, I didn't see you. So, so please. Okay, thank, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, I'm Erna Sosovic, uh, founder and CEO of uh, Bizbook. Uh, and we are a marketplace of business deals. This is actually the first startup uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina who actually uh, managed to turn into company and I'm very proud to be uh, of uh, the head of uh, that kind of organization. Uh, also, uh, so yeah, our, our main goal is to create a platform. Actually, we did do that, but we want to be bigger, of course, uh, where companies can uh, create their own profiles and they can publish offers and demands for other companies and they can just collaborate. So uh, my goal actually was to, to show uh, the potential that Bosnia and Herzegovina had in the entrepreneurship and how many companies uh, we have and what kind of products we have on the market because when I did my research before I started working on Facebook, uh, I found out that there's 70% of uh, companies in Bosnia are actually export, uh, importing stuff uh, and products and services from the countries uh, of all over the, all over the world. And a lot of them we have inside of our country. So I decided to map all the things we have and to show them that we can collaborate between each other and maybe just uh, that some of that money can stay in the country and that we can uh, at that point just promote our company and uh, help uh, our, our government to be better because all of you know how complicated we are. So uh, I think that any solution uh, that anyone gets is uh, only a progress. Uh, so uh, during the, or during the, actually we started 2017 uh, and uh, sorry, just, just a little bit. Uh, 
uh, sorry. So uh, we started 2017 as a, a BNH startup, and we start to, to exploring our potentials inside the other company. Uh, it's Ant Colony, it's a software company who actually built us the first two versions uh, of this book. 2018, we uh, won as a best Boston startup. And uh, after that, uh, we get the, yeah, the next prize is in uh, Podgorica Montenegro for the economical digital transformation. And after that, we got the uh, investment from the Swiss government who actually helped us to build the third version of this book since we built the two of our own. Uh, and, uh, and then just everything started going up. Uh, the, the fun fact is that we actually registered our company in March 2020, uh, right before the, the lockdown. So for three months, we actually couldn't work with our users, but we just gave them a uh, you know, you know, free, free period and helped them to just stay on the market in any way they can and help them to be, uh, to be yeah, better in, in, in that uh, period of time. So after that, we launched the third version in September 2020, and now we have more than 800 companies on board uh, that we are working with them every day. We're helping them to, to get uh, new connections, to present their products and services better, and our next step is to go international. Thank you, Erna. I guess you had the opportunity to hear all the presentations from uh, the other countries. And if you were to compare the Western Balkan countries with each other, how do you think uh, Bosnia fit in this ecosystem? Yeah, I think that we barely fit uh, because we actually do not have a systematical support in Bosnia for all new founded companies and for startups. Uh, so we don't have a funds, uh, only one startup so far was supported by the VC fund uh, and actually were invested in, but it failed, uh, it failed in a year after that, which is, which is fine. But uh, generally investors do not want to invest in Bosnia. Uh, not just, not, not because of ideas, but because of our uh, political situation. So I heard, uh, yeah, I had a conversation with more than 60 investors in the last four years. And all of this said it's not safe to invest in Bosnia. So it's really disturbing. And you know, we, we should really be worried uh, what kind of picture are we sending uh, an image of our country out there if investors are not ready to invest in young people who had uh, great ideas and it's, uh, yeah, it, it's not good for us. So I think that Bosnia needs to work a lot uh, on, on, on that kind of progress and of, of, about you know, uh, you know, marketing Bosnia as, as, as a place where you can really find uh, inspiring people with great ideas and that it, that it, it is the, the, you know, the, the path to, to prosperity of all of us, not just Bosnia, but also for the region. What about the academia perspective? I mean, here in Albania, we have some problems in, in regard with curricula. I mean, students are not, do not have any course in entrepreneurship. I mean, there are some few, uh, very few courses in this field. What about Bos Bosnia? Yeah, do well, you have a proper curriculum in entrepreneurship in the universities or high schools? Well, high schools are uh, not really, not yet. They, they talk, they talk a, lot, a lot about it, but nothing yeah. still haven't been done. Uh, but regarding the university, we have few private universities who are really doing a great job. Uh, but you know, it's not uh, it's not for everyone. Not everyone can can uh, can attend uh, those classes and can uh, be able to pay uh, to to attend that kind of university. But uh, for example, we are now in cooperation with International Birch University when we uh, and we are uh, you know providing the students uh, the, the the place where they can learn about, for example, B two B market. They can work direct, directly with our clients. So now we have like a pilot project uh, when we launched our first, our new uh, product. It is a B2B web shop uh, that our users can uh, edit by themselves and also, uh, you know, control everything. So they don't need any kind of technical experience. If they can uh, edit uh, their Facebook page, they can edit our uh, web shop. Uh, so the, the group of students, eight of them, are now working with two of our clients uh, and regarding especially that product. And they said that it's really great experience for them. And it, it really tells us that uh, startups uh, anywhere now, we are really, uh, you know, we are changing the culture of, uh, of, of everything, especially, uh, especially in corporate world where, where, you know, everything has 
uh, the place and you know what to do, but here we can do whatever we want. We are, we are changing the rules. So uh, I think that we can also contribute a lot uh, regarding this uh, education in the, in the yeah, high schools and schools because we are ready to collaborate and uh, there are no restrictions. If you want to work with us, we are happy to work with you. Uh, so I think that's the message that we need to send as well. Perfect. Thank you. I think uh, Nedim can have some complementary information, additional ones in regard with the same country? Yeah, thank you. Well, you, you know, it, it's one of the things that I also wanted to talk about um, uh, before the pandemic, about two years ago, I founded the Balkan Leadership Academy. And um, it's, it was not only, you know, you're not only looking at, at, at uh, something that is expensive and something that's not very available, but you also have to educate the market about what is leadership and uh, you know, how can sales impact your business or uh, how, when, how a course of human resource can impact your growth. So that was, that was, the, you know, that, that was the first challenge for us about two years ago. Um, and then, well, of course, I was gonna talk about it later, uh, before, before, right after the pandemic started, you know, there was, there was this choice what to do. Uh, what to do with a business that is based on having 30, 50, 200 people in one room. Um, you know, what is, you know, how are we going to change? So there was, a, there was a logical, a very logical answer that was there. Uh, well, just move all the content that we have, just move it online and then, you know, start selling your product online. But why does it have, why, why would it make sense, you know, to, to, to change so much knowledge on, interviewing and on direct sales and on sales communication in a time where a pandemic has started. And, and at that moment, moment when we decided to close BLA, uh, it was already six months on, uh, going on. So, you know, now the situation is different. And now the, 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 you know, the, there's a light at, at the end of the tunnel, let's say. Uh, but the decision that we made not to, to move online, but to wait, to, pr to pause and or freeze the, 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 the business. Well, to this, to, to today we see that it was a smart decision. Why? Because the, um, our coachings and what we, what we intend to, to, to teach today and the workforce of tomorrow is not going to be the same workforce of two years, uh, two years before. We're talking about a workforce that has spent a year and a half at at home, uh, you know, that has confused office colleagues with family members, that has confused home with office. And this is on a, on a global scale. So, you know, just when we talk about something as simple as motivating employees or motivating uh, a sales force, uh, yeah, it's, it's not the same thing. You know, these people, these people will need to acclimatize and then ad adapt just to becoming a workforce, you know, going back home, uh, starting to work. So it's, it, it, it was it was a challenge before. It is still a challenge today. Uh, the pandemic has frozen it for for a while, but you know the same challenges remain as there uh, as there were before for anybody that wants to educate the market or uh, any sort of industry. And now, if they're willing just to adapt a little bit, um, I think there is yet again. Well, um, I think there could be yet again a potential here in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you, Nadim. <clears throat> Is there any questions? Yes. Yes, Erisin. Um, I would like to ask to Erna also and to Nadim, uh, what about uh, support from, from government officials or uh, institutions for, for your companies for entrepreneurship or innovations? in this uh, manner. So regarding the government, government are funding, uh, you know, here the new founded company startup are the same. So if you are uh, you're, you're developing the tech product and if you're opening the hair salon is the same thing. So they say, our government always said, we founded 300 startups. None of them is tech startup or none of them is some innovation. So they are all new founded companies and we actually, ask uh, for our you know, authorities to change that, that you know, for new founded companies, totally different 
from the startup and they should be you know diverse in the law and they have they should have uh, you know different treatment uh, so that's why we cannot for example also in bosnia if you are women in tech uh, you cannot apply for any kind of funds because there is no that category in the you know in the listings uh, and also i i you know i went there and talked to them and asked them why are you doing this said, we, we cannot change anything you know that those are the rules and we just have to do by the rules say why this is discriminating you know i i have a tech tech product and there, there is a money available for women in entrepreneurship, but not for women in tech. So we have a lot of things uh, to work here, uh, but uh, regarding the innovation and startups, you cannot get any kind of fund and any kind of startup. Uh, you can apply, there are a few organizations who can really help with, uh, for example, a Swiss entrepreneurship program, uh, also Foundation 787, you have Mosaic Foundation as well. They all work in that area. Uh, but none of them actually have a huge amount of money that they can invest in and, and, and to say, okay, let's support this, uh, this, this startup and let's, let's work with them. So you can get a mentorship, you can get, you know, uh, any kind of education, uh, but, but not, 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 there are no funds uh, for development. Uh, what, what, what is your cooperation with the Chambers of Commerce in this uh, regard? Yeah, they called me, <laughs> we had a meeting and they said, you know, you're interfering in our work. So we have to do something about it. <laughs> yeah, we, we should support each other. You know, it, it's, not, it's not okay, but they, no, you should, you know, just lay down, you can work with some companies, but don't go, don't, don't aim for big ones. Uh, they're ours. Uh, it, it's sad, you know, here, we, we have three sides of everything and you cannot find one person to talk to them because you have three directors of Chamber of Commerce Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you have to reach each one of them and each one of them has its own interests. So it, it, it's impossible. I, I tried for, uh, for four years to talk to them to get uh, some, because we, we actually can really help each other. They're offering like digital, uh, digital uh, chamber of commerce and you can see all the companies there, what they're doing, but I'm offering the, 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 the offer and uh, demand. So I'm matching companies instantly what they need. Uh, and they can cooperate. So it's really, you know, we are a match, but they, they didn't see it that way. So we, did, we didn't make it. Maybe you have to make a memorandum for <laughs> cooperation. Yeah, maybe, maybe with, with the presidents for, <laughs> for start, <laughs> and maybe we can get something. But for example, the Amtel uh, company, it's uh, for now it's largest BH telecom in, in Bosnia. Uh, they, they ask us for partnerships. So now we are in ongoing partnership with them. They want to sell our services to their users. So it's, it's, it's something new. It's new for them and new for us. So we are, you know, testing and learning a lot, but it, it's one way to go up, of course. Do you have any plans for uh, taking your business out of Bosnia, like uh, with the Western Balkan countries to make more <clears throat> uh, cooperation in this aspect? Yeah, that's, that's the goal. Uh, Bizbook should be, and uh, it will be, I hope, uh, the regional network for businesses so that we can, you know, all connect with each other and see what, what's out there. Because I think that this is the area of 24 million people and it's, it's, it's a great potential for, for not just for me, for, yeah, for my company, but also for the people who work in this, uh, this region. Uh, so yeah, that's the plan. And I already start negotiating with one company from, uh, from Croatia. They are interesting to, uh, to start uh, selling this book out there uh, and also talking to Lazar about the Serbian market. He's helping me a lot to reach, uh, to reach some, reach some people out there. Uh, I also got a, a offer from Russia. You wouldn't believe, but there's an investor from Russia who is interested too. So you, you just have to, you know, you, you just have to make it through those probably four or five years and then someone will notice you. Uh, this is not Silicon Valley. We, we should not, you know, be enchanted by those stories because this is the reality. You have to work uh, twice as hard as anyone else in the world. And maybe one day someone will notice you, but I believe that every work will pay off at that one point. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, according to a study here in Albania, we have more incubators and accelerators than startups. What about Bosnia? How do they function? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's a question for one great research. I think that you can maybe get a huge fund for that kind of research. Uh, we don't have any kind of accelerator here. There were, uh, there were a few attempts to, to get one. 
Uh, but like I said, the investors just said, okay, it's not safe to invest. So there's no point of, of you know, building this, the, the accelerator here. But there are a lot of uh, accelerators from the region who are hunting our startups. And a lot of them actually transfer their companies in Croatia or Slovenia or Serbia, uh, because all of those countries have much better ecosystem and much better support than we do. So it's much easier, especially if you don't have a family and, uh, and kids, so you can just pack your bags and go out there and build your company. So no, we, we don't have, uh, we have few startups and non-accelerator, but there are a few of us who are really fighting uh, to be visible. And may, maybe some, someday someone will really say, okay, we can use those people who really uh, learned a lot through the path and we can, uh, you know, maybe with them do something and create something uh, for, for the people who, will, who are willing to work on their ideas. To be sincere, I don't know which is worse, to have more startups than incubators <laughs> or more incubators than startups. True. <laughs> But if you have incubators and accelerators, the startups will come. Uh, but if you don't have a place to go to and you don't have you know, a place where you can uh, get some answers, then it's much harder to go through that path. But if you have that address, then you will probably at least think to try. So I think yeah, it's better it, to have. In this case, if the number of incubators is increasing, it means that they are more profit-oriented. That's why it's not yeah. the perfect uh, scenario for the program but thank you Erna thank you I ask a question if there is time for it or yeah well uh thank you Erna for the nice presentations um that you did also with the other colleague uh Nedim uh I just uh, wondering since we are, are not talking... colleagues but you are not colleagues sorry sorry for the uh uh, misunderstood in the relation. I'm sorry. They are just from the same country. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, sorry. Uh, so the question goes to Erna, but probably even Mr. Nedin can answer. I would like to know what do you think about the innovation uh, ecosystem in the region, especially in Balkan, and uh, what initiatives you suggest that can be implemented from the government, but also from other, uh, let's say, uh, parts like private sectors or even from the incubator itself to improve this ecosystem, because it seems that we are lacking behind a bit uh, compared to other countries. So seen from your side, like you are working every day on this and probably things that you are doing are more like uh, practical. Nadine, would you like to answer? Yeah, sure. Thank you. The, the, the situation right now uh, in, in the Balkans, so in the WB6, uh, as they call it, in, it's a little bit different in every country. But uh, what can be actually done and what, can, what, what the people that are really trying to make an impact on the ecosystem are the ones focusing on startups. So, uh, and, and, you know, going through the government and trying to make uh, differences in laws in all these different countries is very complicated. But entertaining, entertaining startups and entertaining young people to have ideas and to share their ideas. And so investing in that sort of ecosystem is possible. It's a long road. And, you know, it's a funny thing because it's 2021 we should already have been, you know, at a certain stage with, with, with this entire ecosystem, but we are not. We have actually made some steps back. So entertaining startups, entertaining young people, or well, well entertaining people and their ideas, because I think in the entire Balkan region, if uh, somebody finds an idea uh, and if this startup, you know, starts to roll and, and or make sense, I have found and seen well, I can't say very oftenly because that would be a lie, but you know, uh, 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 let's say on a higher rate, um, these startups can find solutions in Montenegro, in uh, Serbia, in Slovenia, in, uh, well, sometimes even in Croatia. So in Albania and in Kosovo, you know, so they, 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 there might be a certain fit that is good for them. And then they're, you know, there could be a change. Even our situation where one of one of the businesses where I'm involved in and where I'm a co-founder is a super hub. And it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
it's based in Montenegro, Kievia, but there are startups here from Sarajevo because, you know, simply they could benefit more by being uh, part of that hub. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Yeah, it seems that uh, it seems clear to me to understand a bit the situation on these differences. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question. Okay, Christine. Sorry. Okay, my question for Nadim is um, also even for Erna. Has anyone profited a grant from their government? No, from, well, uh, me is in Bosnia, from Bosnia, no. Uh, in Montenegro, we, we might, but until now, no, not, nothing concrete. But we might this year include some funding from uh, the, have received any sort of money or support uh, here and in Montenegro have been foreign, so, or the United States or Sweden or, um, yeah, or European Union. Okay, thank you. I have another question. What policies did your government implement after COVID-19 started? Maybe this can be a topic of discussion for all the entrepreneurs here, since we have them from different countries in Balkan. Yeah, sure. But you can start with Bosnia since you directed the question to Nedim and Erna. Okay, so I'm repeating the question again um, for everyone, but let's start with Erna. Uh, what policies did your government implement after COVID-19 started? Uh, well, we had, uh, yeah, they actually tried to uh, to give us uh, support, uh, especially for the tourist uh, tourist workers. And for the uh, you know for the uh, restaurants and all those who are very affected uh, with the COVID directly to give them some kind of amount for the salaries of the uh, employees so they don't get don't lose their job and uh, also for some uh, you know uh, operational expenses uh, but it then it wasn't really enough for them to to cover uh, all the losses and then uh, in one point you go through the town and you see that the, the whole uh, coffee shops are out and, uh, you know, they, they, don't, they even took the furniture. So uh, the people were really afraid because they actually, they, they were a lack of the, you know, emergency, uh, emergency response of our government. It was all, uh, all with the, everything happened with a, a huge delay. So we actually watched the Croatia and Serbia, what they're doing. And then like months after we actually uh, said, okay, uh, we will do that too, but it was it was late for some people, and a lot of them lost their jobs and uh, closed their companies. We know because we saw through our uh, own users how many of them call us and said, "Oh, we cannot, you know, pay you anymore because uh, we are closing everything." We decided it's not, we don't know how long this will take. So, uh, regarding the policies, uh, nothing really happened that is really worth saying. So it was all some kind of small, uh, you know, small actions who actually didn't help. Uh, anyone and uh, even even now we didn't get uh, we didn't still we, we just start to uh, importing vaccines like the last one in the region so it was actually tells you a lot how we are uh, you know un unprepared for this, these kind of situations and I don't know are they doing anything to prepare themselves for the period that yet to come because uh, the, the effects the, the effects of the COVID are still uh, we will see it for the next five years probably and so far we didn't see that anything they are preparing anything good for us. Yeah, I, for Bosnia and Herzegovina, I completely agree with Erna. Yet, so the, the, I could have answered that with none or nothing. Yeah, I, absolutely, absolutely. So the, no, no, nothing made sense. Nothing was done on time. Uh, anything that was promised uh, was not executed. Was not given enough. I can give you a direct example of a small business, a very successful small business, uh, one of the most famous nail salons in here in Sarajevo. Uh, they always pay their taxes. You always get your receipt when you come there. Um, anyway, she sent, you know, after the lockdown and everything and all the calculations uh, for, for, for being closed and not having uh, uh, the help that the government decided to give her was 20 km, which is 
uh, nine, which is nine, nine and a half euros. Yeah, so none. Uh, you know, Venia, for example, the government just supported for like three months with 200 euros, the people who were unable to work and just gave 350 euros for some other businesses. So that's, uh, I wanted to like, what happened to your countries? Yeah, it's true. At least we got some help from the government during the difficult period of pandemic. Ersin, how was in North Macedonia since you were discussing previously? Okay, so if there is no other question, then I should accept that it has been a really fruitful discussion. Many countries in one platform, lots of success stories and good practices provided by very developed countries like Sweden. Uh, also a kind of comparison among, among the countries in Western Balkan. So in case there is any questions directly to the speakers, just feel free to write them so they can answer before they leave or before we take the break. Uh, this session was dedicated to all the attendees for an open talk with each other. Uh, then, in case there is no other question, we can have a break before the expert Tanya, uh, Tanya comes for the workshop on how to raise investment. Hope it works for you. Uh, we'll start the workshop uh, at 1 o'clock p.m. So. Until then, hope you have a good break. Okay, thank you.
Hi, Dania. Hello, everyone. How are you? Very nice. Very nice to be here and great discussions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for letting me. Thank you for letting me be part of this. Our pleasure. Uh, we have to wait a couple of minutes. People are just joining the room. I just noticed that Milo from Montenegro joined us. Hi, Milo. Hello, hello, everyone. How are you? I'm good. We, we met Montenegro during the discussion. Yeah, but <clears throat> greetings from Stockholm, from Sweden. I'm very, oh. I'm very looking forward to Tanya's uh, workshop because it's a well-known institution here and uh, i'm sure that somehow you know it's a mixed feelings because western balkan it's kind of another world and sweden it's completely different so many opportunities out here so it's good to to listen and hear both sides and i'm sure that this program and event already brought so many great ideas for cooperation and col collaboration in future and I'm sure that we have to fight somehow as from, you know, like entrepreneurs and energy from Western Balkan to bring more experts knowledge, but and as well investor investments from Sweden and EU. So it's our task actually, actually to, you know, show our passion and to really fight and never stop, you know, this uh, journey, which is really tough from um, country to country as we, could hear today so i'm really looking forward to the next session thanks thank you thank you for joining Uh, Tanya, I will make you the host, but you have to accept people entering the room. Okay, I'm just doing it now so you can share your presentation. Mm -hmm. We will do that. I think I should uh, say a few words when I, everyone is here, um, which I guess we need to wait a couple minutes or are you ready? I think we can start now since it's the time. Uh, okay. I, I would like yes. to, to just uh, interrupt a little bit here. <laughs> uh, maybe not everyone knows, but Tanya is a, is a colleague of mine uh, at uh, the School of Economics uh, at Lund University. And uh, we both uh, started our PhD back in uh, 2015. And, uh, um, and uh, Apparently, Tanya uh, took a much better uh, path than I did. Uh, she, she taught, she engaged herself very well in the ecosystem, uh, and, and she really did a fantastic job in, in, uh, in, in her PhD, where uh, uh, she did not only manage to finish a PhD, but also to work on, on, on uh, uh, on, on the side of uh, teaching and the side of being involved with the ecosystem around her. And uh, uh, it happened to be that Tanya just defended her PhD yesterday. Uh, so uh, on my behalf, I would like to congratulate her uh, on, on her amazing achievement. And what I would like to say here is, is that um, it is seldom that you have um, uh, PhD holders with some good uh, entrepreneurial background. Uh, and I think this is a lethal combination 
uh, that people can have. Uh, and, 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 and Tanya is lethal uh, in that sense. Uh, she has amazing <laughs> experience in entrepreneurship. Oh, and, uh, and I think that the way she, she had uh, actually written her, her fantastic book, I would say, if, I'm not sure if you can see it, but yeah, this is the book uh, with, uh, with the bootstraps and all of that. Uh, I think that uh, uh, today we are up to something really. I'm not setting. I'm 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 setting the bar high for you, Tanya. But uh, uh, I really want to uh, like people to know that uh, that uh, uh, we have really amazing people out there doing really fantastic job. And and uh, the the book that she wrote is is really uh not only theoretically grounded and theoretically based but also extremely well crafted in terms of empirics and it was a longitudinal study where she brought an amazing uh, overview and, and new insights into the boot, bootstrapping um, field which i'm not an expert uh, uh, in but but uh, at least what i read for now once i mean makes me wanting to to learn and and, and read more so I congratulate you, uh, Tanya, for the amazing achievement yesterday. And I wanted to share this uh, among everyone here. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ziad. You're like a big brother. I want to hug you now. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so I guess uh, I don't have that much more to say about myself. I will say a few more words. Um, also, you see that Ziad has an autumn where he is it's uh, it's almost summer where i am uh, but uh, but we do uh, we are located at the same school at lund um yes uh you will probably hear the word bootstrapping a little bit too often that is the project of passion and this is something that lies very close to heart um I'm going to be sharing some slides and it's a real pity that we cannot really hold this workshop in the workshop format in a dialogue. So I would like to encourage you to um, interact with me to the um, uh, at the level it is possible in this online format so feel free to write uh, in the chat as we go and we try to build on that as we discuss. Um, also, I was thinking that it could be a good idea to, um, if you could, if you have an opportunity, have uh, something to make notes on and maybe some post-it notes that you could fill in uh, with some insights. Yes, uh, so I will try to share my presentation. Let's see. One should have become an expert on doing the digital things by now. Um, we did the Lund University, uh, the Lund visit uh, virtually, so the workshop would be easy peasy. <laughs> yeah, right. And by the way, I wanted to also say that I'm going to be um, teaching quite a lot at the SAIP school this year. So we roll out, as, uh, as Andres uh, said in the morning, uh, already now on Friday. Really looking forward to it. Um, so if there are any future SAIP participants here in the room, you will be seeing me again. <laughs> here we are. I found my presentation. You see my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. Uh, so I called my presentation, my workshop, I would like us to think about where, how, and at what cost we may attract resources to our startups. And when I say resources, of course, there is a diversity of different things we as entrepreneurs might need, but it all comes down to finances. It all comes down to allowing the company freely and with liquid cash and bank develop and grow. Uh, one reflection I had during the morning sessions, all these uh, wonderful discussions that we have had um, is that entrepreneurship is extremely contextual. There is no one size fits all. There is no any kind of recipe for success that will fit South Sweden, 
West Africa, Silicon Valley, Balkan countries, it's all very contextual. So of course I'm wearing my Swedish hat now and my personal experiences as being entrepreneur in Sweden, as being working also on the policy side here in Scandinavia. And uh, we will try to go a little bit on the level where we can analytically apply those tools to our local contexts. Okay. Uh, so as I said, uh, a large sheet of paper, if you have that at hand, or maybe not too large, some post-it note, post notes, if you have them, we will try to get really practical and write in the chat. I see that there is already something in the chat. I don't know if it's... Yes, <laughs> there is no pressure on me, apparently. Good. Um, yes, so look at this. Back in 2012, or was it 11? It was 11, it was quite many years ago. I uh, flew over uh, a night city in a plane, not on my own wings, and, uh, and just suddenly wondered why there is so much lighting. What do we really need that much energy to be wasted? Where there is probably in most places, in that beautiful laid up city, no real need for it. Of course, we have to have security. Of, of course, we have to have this cityscape that communicates some kind of life going on there. But is it really that efficient? Here, I must also make a disclaimer that this is not my picture. This is Chicago. I didn't fly over Chicago and the picture is credited there in the corner. So I came back to Sweden. Um, I was already a part of um, entrepreneurial crowd and worked very close to university. And I myself had a business background, but I worked with a lot of engineers. And we started discussing with a couple of people with engineering background, what we can do in order to solve this problem that we envisioned, that there is a lot of light being, being wasted in cities like this. Uh, we came up first with a very, exciting solution at that time it was it was quite unique it's later when we uh, uh, when the technology iot and uh, smart lighting on remote controls of infrastructure really blossomed at that time it was quite unique uh, so what we did we thought okay we have a real revolutionary idea we get some support from lund university in patenting it we start developing it with help of some, um, uh, as we thought, a huge investments from um, venture capitalists and, uh, and we become uh, super successful and environmentally conscious entrepreneurs. Uh, what happened then? Um, what we faced actually was that um, there is a lot of interest. We actually were quite quick and indeed got some support from university in terms of small uh, test, test grants. And we uh, uh, developed a very rough, quite ugly prototype of the system that's supposed to go in the street lamps and uh, make them aware of the time of the day, of a presence of people and adjust the level of lighting. The, uh, the device was like this size. It looked like an old radio. And, um, but we were completely unashamed. We were so uh, in love with our idea. Uh, but then it stopped there. There was a lot of interest. Uh, we were even on newspapers and everything, but it was kind of, it halted there. We didn't have resources. We had to use our personal money to uh, travel for the meetings, to buy business lunches to all the people we had to meet. Okay, I have to admit some people here. Um, and the question, where is the big money? Where is the big money? That's something that bugged us every day. Where is that idyllic Silicon Valley picture where you come and pitch to the big investor or very probably meet the big investor in the elevator, pitch for one minute, get money. Um, well, according to 
research as then uh, I realized much later, I started the company in 2012. I became my research journey in 2015. According to all the great reports and all the international organizations that um, actually deal with it on a daily basis with analysis of global uh, innovation development and availability of financing, uh, there are some critical success factors that have to be considered. And really, as, as, uh, as we already mentioned before, everything is very contextual and there is indeed big money, for example, in Silicon Valley, for example, in Copenhagen, if you take Scandinavia, keeping on admitting people, welcome. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, in China, but it is not, it's very far. These cases are outliers. This is very far from the general entrepreneur, uh, the av availability of uh, big investments. Uh, what is important, uh, if you are lucky to be in one of those uh, ecosystems where financing is available, uh, is the, if you look at the uh, successful business parks, science parks, welcome, I admitted someone else, uh, it's the access of knowledge. So it's highly ranked in popular universities that attract, that have the capacity to uh, allow the laboratories, the grants and financing for test projects, is the supportive governments. So favorable taxation system for small businesses, grants and subsidies that are available. I think in Sweden, we are quite fortunate. I personally come from Ukraine, I should have said that. And uh, one of my co-founders comes from Turkey and another one is Swedish. And we've always said, at least me and the Turkish co-founder, that we would never be able to achieve what we have achieved back home. So we were very fortunate to be here. Uh, entrepreneurial culture, to what extent is actually accepted in the society and appreciated? To what extent being an entrepreneur actually has a high status? Well, in some, some countries it is not. I met people from Middle East who would say, who would get offended if they were called, uh, people that would be running businesses, successful business, would get offended if they were called entrepreneurs, because it's just some student playing around with ideas, something unserious, they would call themselves businessmen. Uh, so entrepreneurial culture has to also be in place there. Access to workforce. The places like Silicon Valley, the places like well, even the Copenhagen area, the greater Copenhagen, as they now call the whole um, northern Denmark and south Sweden, uh, has a great access to, um, has a very liberal, liberal immigration, low, low um, high living standards. So all these factors promote uh searching and accessing the big finance but what to do if you are not in those regions can it uh, does it mean that there is no chance for you no idea to be entrepreneur at all well absolutely not uh we gotta still understand we gotta still acknowledge that these companies that really make a breakthroughs and raise a lot of big money, a lot of investment venture capital. They are outliers. They are maybe a mere 2% of the whole entrepreneurial scene in the world. Let's see. Yes, and here, um, I don't know to what extent you would be interested to, to getting these slides later on, but I could send them to organizers. I have no problem with you uh, using them. So here are some examples, and you see that it's quite concentrated in the certain areas that have those uh, conditions that we just discussed. And there is a quite high concentration of capital. If you see the picture of the whole world, it's very few places where you have that wide availability of finance. Here you see the biggest uh, investment uh, capital firms. And you also see that here I'm admitting people, keeping on doing that. Uh, and you also see that it's mostly USA. Uh, Europe, 
you see Great Britain. Unfortunately, don't see Balkans. Um, yes, you see a few Swedish companies, which is quite impressive for Sweden being such a small nation. But then again, um, is this mo uh, big money available? We just established that it's not. Not for everyone and not everywhere. So this is something that we have to just accept and acknowledge. And it doesn't mean that we have no chances in starting up, running innovative companies. Um, yes. So what's the problem? What's the problem with those areas where the big money is not that easily available? It's market opacity. This is something that unfortunately one cannot avoid. That means that we as a small entrepreneur, as a uh, often, often also quite young person, um, do not have that complete picture. We cannot just understand how the market in our area works by buying a McKinsey report. We cannot do that. So market is quite foggy like walking in a fog and trying to make sense of what is going on. At the same time, we have to be quite fast because the more resourceful competitors may come into the picture. This is actually what happened to my smart lighting company as well. We struggled quite a lot without the speed, without the lack of information about the market and the speed of development. Um, so this is also something to consider, something to acknowledge, and something always to have on your, on the back of your mind. Global competitiveness, that's uh, exactly what I said now. And this is what has been discussed, by the way, a lot in the morning, uh, that borders almost do not exist anymore, especially for technical innovations. Um, um, yes, so we have to consider that. We have to also consider the concentration of knowledge, expertise, and money in those um, few points of the world that we that we just seen information asymmetry that comes uh, that's our own problem as entrepreneurs we want to attract external financiers well we have much more information than they have and we also have quite biased information we're so protective for our babies our startups we're so in love with them that it's very difficult for, for, for investors, for external uh, actors with their experience, they usually much more experienced people uh, in the field. Uh, it's very difficult to make sense of what is actually, what, what is it actually we can deliver compared to what we are saying we can. Uh, there is this notion of hockey stick, you know, but you always have to draw for investor. Well, in practice, it doesn't happen. And investors, smart people, they realize that as well. Liabilities of agent scale, that means that, again, a small company has a, a big struggle to develop that position where it is legitimate, where it is interest, interesting for big money. And at the same time, we internally, as an entrepreneur, as a small entrepreneurial uh, team lacking finance, uh, we are not able to um, catch up with the market and the need it pays. So it goes both internally we face these liabilities and externally. Uh, yes, so this is a little bit of a background as to why we should not expect, we generally should not expect coming up with a genius idea and raising billions and uh, buying ourselves Tesla. Um, uh, in six months time. Well, maybe some do, and, and, and we know that some do, but this is a very uh, outlying cases. Welcome, welcome people. It's great, it's great to know, uh, actually. Great. Um, let's move next. The availability of finance, the way you want to go about resourcing and financing you go, um, your, your idea, your firm, will always depend on what kind of, kind of idea you have. Of course, this is quite obvious, but it will also depend on who you are as a person, what kind of entrepreneur you are. And uh, I don't know, if we would be sitting together in the room right now, and I would ask you, how would you define an entrepreneur? We are now 37 people in this virtual room. 
I think we would get at least 30 different definitions of what is entrepreneurship and who is an entrepreneur. It's an innovator, it's an in inventor, ambitious individualist who just wants to take control and do things by, by himself or herself. It's the game changer that is just unhappy with some things that happen in society and wants to drive the change. Maybe it's a forced entrepreneur, maybe it's a person with no other options. And depending on uh, how we can position ourselves, define ourselves, uh, that's also very important self insight. We might go a little bit different paths when it comes to raising finance. Uh, by the way, if something I say is a little bit unclear or you would like to uh, challenge me on something that I say, please jump in and just uh, write a quick note in the chat and um, I can elaborate on something of uh, what I'm saying. Uh, yes, there is also theory of status. We talked before about um, accept social acceptance of being an entrepreneur or a businessman in certain countries, business owner. Um, and then perhaps some people are attracted by, um, by this aspect. Uh, yes, Alfred, do you hear me? Uh, could you please turn off the camera? That's a request that came to me. I don't, I'm not really sure how to, uh, how to do it on my side. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Alfred. Um, and now I think you might also need to mute, mute yourself. <laughs> Thanks for cooperating. I know it's a big challenge to do this in the, in the virtual room with a lot of people. Well, however you define yourself and how, as an entrepreneur and uh, whichever environment, entrepreneurial environment, whether resource rich or resource scarce, two things are absolutely certain. You cannot do this alone. You will need to involve a lot of external stakeholders. And here is an important thing. Here is what I've experienced myself and here is what my research has shown very clearly, even if you bootstrap. I will explain a bit later what bootstrapping actually is, but you've probably heard this word a lot already. Even if you bootstrap, even if you pay out of your own pocket, take the uh, mortgage on your house to finance the business, you still have stakeholders that are being affected by that decision. So as an entrepreneur, you can never, um, disregard the impact that stakeholders make on you and you make on stakeholders while financing the firm. And of course, you cannot do this empty handed. If you have a lots of money on bank, you still have a need from other kinds of resources, right? Uh, here we go into resources. So basically resources is anything and everything entrepreneurs might need and use for the purpose of developing their businesses. Uh, it's not always money, but they're always transferable into the uh, firm finance. Here, try to understand, uh, please, what I mean. If you get some service for free, for example, you are allowed to use or you work from your own garage. This is very popular myth, right? That all the companies start from a humble garage. Uh, even if you do that, and you don't pay anything for that. That means that other resources that you have uh, at hand, you save and you can reinvest them. So any kind of resources will be in one way or another, in the end of the day, showing off on your balance sheet, on your pure financial situation. So resources are pure finance. It's a premises, production facilities, physical resources, intangible resources, very important point here, especially for young and small firms who are suffering from those liabilities of age and scale that we mentioned before. Uh, and it's highlighted in bold here, human and social resources. Next, we will touch upon a little bit on the ways to make decisions as an entrepreneur. And here, 
just allow me. I don't know if you came to this workshop with the expectation that we will only be talking about acquisition of money, but that conversation could be uh, could be very short. <laughs> so I want to give you some background into how um, how you can reason. Maybe your big money is not only unavailable in the, in the area where you are, but maybe it's also not what you need. Here, let's move on. So your usual priority order. Let's take an average non-Silicon Valley, non-high uh, concentration uh, resourceful environment. Your usual entrepreneur would likely go in this order about financing the firm. It will be first financing at hand. And here I wrote a bit of different concepts. We will go through them. Then it will be debt financing, most likely. So the loans, the some types of crowdfunding, we will go through this. We will, through this. We will elaborate on this. Uh, and only in the last hand, equity will come. And equity is that, that traditional investment that you are very eager, not saying you, one is very eager as an entrepreneur to go for first. This is, this is perhaps not, not the optimal way. And for what reason it's not the optimal way? Uh, well, first of all, uh, the, second, the second and third, what we would call a traditional finance, debt and equity, they are very seldom available immediately because of those liabilities we've discussed, right? Um, it's also quite common, common central to start testing your idea with your own finance before you go out there. So it's, uh, you might be bootstrapping without even realizing you do that. You probably, you're very likely to do so. You're, pro you're very likely to not start your business with renting an office facility, but in your garage or in the incubators. There was, uh, there was one interesting, very interesting speech from the Tirana Science, Science Park, right? Where, where one could get a free office space. That is also a form of bootstrapping. So that is financing at hand. You might just naturally intuitively go for this option first. And then it might be a strategic uh, choice because uh, whether, whether we are, um, of course we are attracted by that big money, yes, from the debt and venture capital, but it costs so much when we are young and small as, entrepren as, as entrepreneurs. You will have to give up a lot of share, a lot of control in your company if you go for equity first. And there are other aspects that we will discuss later. Um, yes. So apart from that uh, usual order, you go by, let's call it pecking order. Just imagine you have a basket of fruits and, and, and you like bananas the most. And, and you go after bananas, then you have just... Uh, uh, oranges and kiwis and you go after oranges and then kiwis are the last so that's the pecking order you think about finance ah this is very simplified of course and one could argue but uh, about like this so pecking orders first and real options you choose your order according to options you have at hand and the options are generally this is not how a normal entrepreneur would reason this is not anyone who would see it at the, at the brainstorming uh, board with a co-founder uh, thinking, okay, should we expand? Should we reconsider? Should we abandon? No. But if you look at your business decisions back, if you even look at your most important life decisions not related to business, uh, these are usually the options you have at hand. So you can either um, expand with help of external, um, extra co-founders uh, with external help, help because you will need that. You cannot be alone. Uh, you might reconsider. You might say, okay, this, this is not really working. I will, this is a very popular word. It has been um, a few years back. Pivot, <laughs> change your idea. Uh, you can decide to abandon, terminate, go and take your 
uh, bank clerk or or whatever. This this is not to be disrespectful to bank clerk, but just like take take a conventional employment somewhere. You may decide to wait and see if you have you, you have other career on the side, uh, and you might decide to contract. And the contracting in this case is uh, would be the big money. So going into the formal legal relationship with stronger stakeholders. So depending on the options you have at hand, and this is usually, unfortunately, is out there. It depends on so many externalities. You cannot steer them so much. If you have an opportunity to, you know, knowledge is power. Knowledge is very important resource. If you have an opportunity to reflect a minute and identify what are your real options just now and which one is most low hanging fruit. Uh, then you can choose more, more accurately uh, your priority of sources of financing. Hmm? Any question or reflections at this point? No, okay. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, actually I planned that we should take a reflection right now. What do you say? I unfortunately don't see, um, I only see a couple of people here in, in the list and they are all without cameras. That's okay, that's up to you. Um, but just for yourself, if you have a business idea, just, just think, just take a minute to think, do you recognize yourself in what I'm saying? Do you relate to that? If not right now, can you go back home? Can you go back to your uh, co-founding team or back to your drawing board, to your brainstorming board and, and really try to take a minute and see what are my real options and what, what are my opportunities uh, to, uh, to choose the right priority order for acquiring finance? Because that picture of, uh, of a big money Again, I'm gonna be returning to the same tagline. The picture of raising big money uh, is very tempting. You might find yourself stuck on this idea, chasing it, uh, but it's, it might be just objectively unavailable and it might be not optimal at the stage where you are at, at the stage you find yourself at. So. Uh, let's say we have reflected. Mm -hmm. Hi, Tanya. Sorry. Yes, yes. I, I can share my experience to make it a bit. Yes, perfect, perfect. Thank you. you. Because, you know, practical experience. So I'm from Montenegro. I have built mm -hmm. my own startup four years ago. I started as a hobby. I work full time. And then as a hobby became mm -hmm. working more on hobby than on full-time job. So from two hours, four hours, six hours, eight hours. So I worked 10 hours on my startup, started to build uh, my team, enter first incubator, second inc first incubator, we didn't get MVP, meaning we didn't have any prototype. Second incubation, we formed the team. We finally got MVP. We finally won the first prize, etc. So everything started spontaneously as my personal experience of building a career abroad in Sweden, in Lithuania, in uh, Slovenia and Montenegro. And actually we are helping job seekers and career coaches. So we are matching job seekers and marketplace for job seekers and career coaches. And then we enter in Western Balkan program together with Anissa in Albania. Then we enter in another program. So, you know, so many incubations and trying to enter accelerator, for instance, in Malme in fa fast track Malmö, mm -hmm. three, three years in a row and meeting so many people from, you know, in Sweden, etc. So to short the story, now I arrived, actually, we got one offer in Croatia, one offer in Slovenia, like accelerators, but those were a bit low amounts for, you know, because now you are talking about financing. So until now, we are still bootstrapping. That's first message that, mm -hmm. that I want mention because i myself for last one year and a half i can earn my salary through offering the service through my own startup 
So I can survive. I can live like this, let's say next, I don't know, five, 10, 30 years, right? You can ask. We just ask, uh, how long did it take you to start being able to pay yourself? Well, to be honest, even though everyone was saying, you know, just sell, try to sell and sell, I was firstly uh, building a strong ground, let's call it like that, you know, uh, mm. firstly a team, then I was aware that startup world is completely different than the regular business world, because when I was back in yeah. Sweden uh, eight years ago, I entered one startup and I realized how much I don't know, even though I you know, have one master in Sweden, one master in Slovenia. So what I'm trying to say, I, I, I was aware and that I should invest and enter these in incubators and accelerators and talk with so many different you know, people and smart investors uh, or stakeholders or the most important, of course, coaches and mentors. And I think that's something that you know, young entrepreneurs are making a mistake. They think they know everything and of course you don't know everything so that's why you have to build a team no. that you trust and you can delegate and most important you can execute something from an idea to a first let's say prototype or mvp but so we have mm -hmm. a MVP, and now we are at the stage where we are seeking for investors so i told we got two offers but we declined and now i actually came to sweden for six months it's a great program Erasmus for young entrepreneurs. So, and you can mm -hmm. stay up to six months and I have a great uh, coach, uh, business coach here in, in Sweden. And I'm actually approaching incubators and accelerators and business angels and VCs here in Sweden. That's what I'm doing for the last three, four months. And it's fun because, you know, incubators are saying to us, well, you are already having an MVP, you already have 600 clients. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you should not go through us. And then when you talk with VCs, they say, you know, you only have 35,000 of uh, revenues, which is you yes. know, great, but come back to us because, you know, we need 200,000 or 1 million of revenues mm -hmm. per month. So we are kind of, you know, uh, between, uh, let's say, incubator. So we should go through accelerator or through business mm -hmm. angles for, I don't know, six months, one year to build milestones to package our project to have more market fit yeah. product and more clients and that we all develop as well. And then we could be ready for VCs in Sweden. So different markets are mm. just, you know, different mm. financing opportunities. And that's, that's my story. That yeah, I want to thank, you, thank you so much. This is, uh, this is perfect. And there are many things that I can also um, agree with and relate to from my personal experience it's very common actually to to be in that gray zone right and you realize that you're chasing and chasing and chasing uh one opportunity or the other and you are kind of in between and not fitting and you're losing so much time and you get so frustrated and you're losing motivation so this is something um you know, one thing that is very important to know, so that entrepreneurship, back to the discussion, who is an entrepreneur? Entrepreneurship in most cases, and largely, it is a skill like any other skill. If you wanna learn to play violin, you will need to spend years practicing it, failing, uh, until you can be a master in that, right? If you want to be a successful entrepreneur, of course, there are outliers. Again, there is uh, Steve Jobs and uh, Bill Gates and, and, and you name it. Uh, but this is a very small proportion, right? Normally, you would need to practice the skill. You would need to go out there and fall and learn from your experience. The more you do it, the more chance for success you have. That's, that's what uh, research says. Uh, Yes, thank you, Milo. That was very good. May and also, I also uh, share mine, please? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, uh, my case is totally different. I don't have a business, but I have some ideas. And the problem here in Albania is that there are not too much funds available. So the first challenge is getting the sources where to ask for funds. And also another mm -hmm. challenge is the law, which makes it difficult for startups as the taxes are very high and there is actually no law for startups in Albania. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll continue. I'm just uh, oh, this, fine. These the, are the two challenges, the challenges I find. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'd like yeah, to know how can I 
it's too interesting. Make it, even though I have these mm -hmm. challenges. Mm -hmm. Even the law okay. is implemented, is in the draft, even the law, yeah, is in the drafting phase. But still, it, mm. I mean, the taxes are too heavy for the startups, and this is the mm. main challenge. Mm. This is a for, unfortunately something that in these cases we cannot, these externalities we cannot really influence. Uh, we can just hope that there is a um, substantial base for lobbying through the incubators, through the accelerators. Uh, especially, I would say, in the cases like if I would now uh, try to replicate my Swedish experience in Ukraine, where I come from, where it's a completely different situation, much less availability, I would absolutely not try to start in the garage. They would go in a first hand to the networks and incubators and see what kind of community help there is there. Because I'm sure there is a lot of um, local initiatives and community support in the countries that are quite uh, in the structure, in the governmental structure, taxation stu uh, structure, uh, resistant uh, or challenging for entrepreneurship. Uh, we will go, uh, I see that we've used already uh, half of the time, it just flew away. Uh, so I would like to go through the uh, financing at hand, what is coming first in the priority, those fancy words of effectuation and bricolage and bootstrapping. This is probably something that you already do as an entrepreneurs without reflecting upon it. And I don't say that you need to study literature and learn how to do it. But just know that it's very important too, and you actually can uh, often bridge this gap that Milo talked about also, this gray zone between being too old for the incubator, as a company, not as a person, too old for the incubator and too young for the venture capital. So financing at hand, we start with effectuation. There are some tools that you can apply. Uh, and the first is the bird in the head. You remember when we, when we talked about resources just a couple slides back, uh, there was human and social resources highlighted in bold. This is absolutely, even if you have a rich uncle, uh, even if you, have, uh, if you are spinning off from another company that is quite resource rich, this is your first go, human and social resources. Who I am, what I know and who I know. Uh, so I'm not gonna, uh, as I said, I think, I think there is a lot of information that we will not be able to go in depth on. So I will share the slides with the organizers. And if you have an interest, you can, uh, you can get them later. Uh, so just know that whatever path to finance you choose, uh, you probably have much more at hand than you realize. As I said, in Ukraine, I would not think of, um, as here in Sweden, preparing a, a very rough, quite ugly prototype of a product and go knocking. It's a good, it's a good way to get insights, but I would know for sure that I will not uh, start selling this way. I would go to uh, networks and incubators, for example, or communities. Uh, affordable loss, you know, it's like with investments, with the day trading, you know, cryptocurrency, whatever that people now buy massively. Uh, what's the difference between a gambler and a smart investor? is that you never, uh, you calculate your affordable loss, you think, what is it I'm actually ready to lose in the process? And you never invest more than you're ready to lose. So when you pick the source of finance, you also can think like this, okay, um, now maybe the time is more most important because the technology is developing very fast, that technology that I thought of, or not I even, <laughs> the entrepreneur in question. And maybe if I uh, start financing the firm by own money or raising grants, I will lose that competitiveness. I will lose that market niche. And then the loss of time is greater than the loss of 50% of the company if you go and try to raise um, 
business angel financing. So calculate affordable loss and be ready to, to risk. Because you, you will only risk that what you invest. You will never risk more than that. Um, yes, the lemonade, uh, you know, life gives you lemons. And here it's also very important to be quite flexible with your goals. Uh, the way to think in entrepreneurial way is that you can have multiple outcomes that each and every, dep depending on what you have, depending on what you have at hand, and each and every of those outcomes might be quite satisfactory. In my practice, uh, I met an entrepreneur, for example, I met uh, one entrepreneur who is very successful, quite old now, experienced in age also, uh, has a lot of um, successful companies behind, who said, when I first started with my first entrepreneurial project, my goal was to build a career where I can work six months a year and take a vacation for the remaining six months. This is a very concrete goal, but it's not related to the um, specific product or service, right? Uh, and this, it can be achieved, this particular goal can be achieved in, in many different ways, depending on what kind of means you have at hand. Uh, partnerships, 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 again, to the point that you cannot do this alone, think, never say no to someone stretching you a hand. I'm thinking, okay, if you have an environmental, uh, environmental idea of reducing plastics and you get a business offer from them, um, you, you perhaps not get it served, but there is a potential opportunity to collaborate on something with a plastic producer. Mm? Maybe quite controversial, but uh, don't reject it immediately. Don't act on emotion. There might be still a, a, a great opportunity to, uh, yes, to benefit, for both sides to benefit. Uh, so crazy quilt basically means that you take patches, you take parts that first seemingly do not fit together, but you put them together and it turns out in a quite cool, I should have put a picture, but imagine like some carpet that is consisting of different shapes and, and colors. And a pilot on a plane, uh, you cannot be, uh, as a pilot on a plane, you cannot be sure of, you cannot control externalities, you cannot uh, be sure that there will not be uh, like a crazy wind or crazy storm up there, but you have your controls and that you have at hand, you are steering from A to, uh, to Y to Z, <laughs> yes to Z. Uh, so accept the things you, you can't control. Try to make the lemonade out of them, but really take charge of what you, um, yeah, your skills, abilities, your networks, and, and um, take control of that. There is bricolage. Uh, so always look around for, uh, Bricolage actually is a form of art. It comes from a French uh, word for, maybe someone speaks French. I don't remember. I think it's improvisation, some form of improvisational art where you turn the trash to value, basically. You create forms of art from the resources that others discarded or neglected. See if you can use a resource that you did not at first consider as a resource. Again, your uncle with a conference room or with, with a successful business where they don't utilize a garage. Why should you use your own garage? You can do that instead. Yes, I will provide the slides. Yes, absolutely. I got a question here. Um, yes, uh, we cannot. So it's basically do it yourself. Uh, turn trash to value, and this is a, a big collage is particularly important for eco-social innovation, eco-social entrepreneurship. Uh, yeah, so basically what we touched upon before, uh, we should not take, we should preferably not take, we should not fall into that fallacy thinking that there is one big goal, 
and I should spend a lot of time assembling the money, assembling the means to achieve that goal. That's what we have on the left part, yeah. Uh, but we should think what means we have and what kind of flexible goals we, we might have achieved. Imagine opening the fridge and seeing what there is uh, and cooking your meal out of what there is instead of envisioning the meal, trying to find the ingredients, wasting time of that. This is also a valid path, but in practice, the second way of thinking, the entrepreneurial thinking as it is now on the slide, uh, gets you much further. Uh, reflection we will skip. Uh, you're very welcome to reflect afterwards. This is my um, dearest topic. <laughs> the, the dissertation that I defended yesterday was exactly on bootstrapping. And to be very, very now a pedagogical, I hope you will uh, allow me this liberty. This is the shoe, mm -hmm. my shoe. Um, and this is not a very good example because it's missing the bootstrap, but think the strap that is on the back of the shoe, especially the boot that you use to pull the boot up. Mm? That's pulling, uh, that's achieving your purpose by the aid of very little or, or very simple mean. And that's what bootstrapping means in entrepreneurship context. You're pulling yourself up with very little help or very simple means. Uh, yes, I also like do it yourself, absolutely. Uh, you can, you can uh, do much more than you think you can actually. Um, yes, and there are different, uh, this is a, again, uncle. <laughs> uncle is very important figure in entrepreneurship process. This is the typical story of the uncle that uh, is a successful businessman and has a that is um, not utilized. They maybe use it once a week. So for four days of the week, you can come and work there. What you get then, you don't only get the conference room. You can also use the phone that is there for free, maybe with international call credit. You can also come and drop a couple of questions to the company accountant, just like this over coffee. Uh, you can also participate in some uh, after work. Uh, where you meet your first customer. So this is very important to not discard that uncle that could be of help for you. This is also the way, um, the classic way of bootstrapping. Uh, and there are different kinds of uh, forms. Uh, this is also priority order. You would usually bootstrap with the financing from your own pocket first, then you would go for subsidy financing. The, this is not very linear. It can work uh, in, in waves and circles. You can come back to one or another, or they can interlock, overlap. But this is the normal, um, uh, normal way of reasoning for bootstrap resources. Um, but what's important to understand that all of them are relationship oriented. So whatever you do out of those behaviors, you, you have a stakeholder that is dependent on you and that you are dependent on. Uh, so take care of your relationships, whatever you do out of bootstrapping. So that uncle should be so appreciated. He should be invited to your wedding. Uh, he should be always get the prettiest uh, post, uh, postcards for Christmas um, and so on. Um, yes, so we go, we go very quickly through these uh, different ways to bootstrap. Um, if it's owner financing, what is meant here, uh, evaluate the costs and rewards, evaluate the affordable cost, uh, affordable loss. Maybe you should not mortgage your house at the first hand, even if it's very beneficial for your um, business because your family is affected badly by that situation. Maybe it's less, uh, maybe it's less uh, risky if your partner is working somewhere else, uh, has a good salary and you don't mortgage so much. So evaluate that. Don't just kind of dive into it without uh, thinking twice. Uh, grants and subsidy financing, I, of course, don't have a very good um, outlook at what is available in uh, um, Albania and Balkans. Uh, 
this is what I personally used. Um, and this is what we also uh, look at with our startups that are being born and raised here at, at the master program and at the DEO on Science Park. Uh, look at European funding. What is important here to consider though, is that you probably shouldn't, probably it's not a good idea to look directly, to go directly into the uh, European Union for funding, but there are usually some middlemen available locally. In Sweden, there is an organization called Vinova, which is basically a governmental unit for entrepreneurship support. They have, they receive money, so they are middlemen, they receive those money from European Union, and then they uh, have some applications uh, that they can uh, divide in a smaller chunks to, uh, to local companies. And there is a question in the chat. Almi is great in Sweden, absolutely. Almi is awesome. And um, that is uh, not only, uh, that's also investment capital. Uh, that is very easily, it's much more easily attainable than your, any professional venture capital firm. Um, so look for those actors who are middlemen between you and the European Union. You know, my company, the lighting company that I mentioned before, we did get sorry, we did get quite a lot of European uh, funding directly, but it's like, depending on the nature of your idea, how, uh, how much you're fitting to the current priorities in mainstream, there is like maybe not more than 6% of applications uh, European wide uh, that gets granted. And now suddenly I actually think, I'm not sure, they're probably both Balkan is not uh, part of that, or maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but it's maybe only uh, EU companies, but I'm sure there should be some middleman that is um, taking care locally of that um, grant pool bucket. Uh, yes, someone is correcting me. Of course, there is in Albania some, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Uh, so what I'm saying, they should be your first. When you think big grants, they should be the local representatives should be your first point of contact. Not European Commission directly, perhaps, because it took us, I have a great gray hair here because, <laughs> because of all the grant applications that I've uh, written and um, all the stakeholders I tried to coordinate for quite a little money in the end, if you consider the effort you put in. Uh, so Horizon Europe, uh, that you can look at. There are different, I think every year or every two, three years, they change priorities and challenges. And then it's very good if you are suddenly in the stream of, uh, of uh, interest. Uh, I'm just looking at the time. We have half an hour left. This is still quite decent. Um, yes. So one of the forms to bootstrap is trying to use as little as possible of what you have at hand. Uh, what we said in the beginning. Yeah, we said if you are working at the garage, this is your typical, typical minimizing financing. You save some money that you would otherwise spend on renting an office space and you can reinvest it back into business. There are some implications, of course. It's not always good. You should again evaluate the affordable loss and risks associated with this. It might, uh, it might impact your community. It might impact your spouse if you use the garage. Uh, this is, of course, very simplistic, but uh, don't take those sources of financing resources. Don't take them uncritically for granted. Your uncle has an apple tree. <laughs> Everyone wants to have that uncle. Um, what is here? I wanted to uh, uh, illustrate here the community impact, what I mean by community impact. If your uncle has an apple tree and uh, every autumn you get a lot of apples because the uncle is not able to eat them up, he says, okay, I will throw them otherwise I, I give you some and you say thank you and you eat up those apples you give them to kids you make apple pies but then one autumn uncle brings them to you and you think well I actually don't even like apples that much I should 
uh, start cooking marmalade, put them in the nice jars, sell them, build a business that way. And you do succeed and you build a crazy uh, successful marmalade business. Uh, next time your uncle comes, you say, oh, well, you said you said you the apples. Could you this time give me 10 buckets instead of one? Um, I think your uncle might do it because he does throw a lot of apples. Uh, but it's it's a bit strange, right? Uh, it's a bit strange feeling that actually now suddenly you are making profit on some resources that you get for free. And if there is a, another um, another relative approaching uncle and say, okay, I, I would like this year uh, 15 buckets of apples, uh, uncle would probably not go for it. So if you are in a network where you are using a lot of bootstrapping with one particular actor, you need to realize that it also affects other, other companies, possibility of other companies to attract the resource in the same way. <laughs> yes, uncle's great. Um, yeah, so here are some advantages and disadvantages of bootstrapping. It's the quickest and cheapest resources available. It's the lowest hanging fruit. You get to retain your ownership. Your company is still yours. I met uh, fantastic cases here in South Sweden where uh, entrepreneur has uh, has done everything from uh, uh, <laughs> from uh, I don't know uh, all, always getting free lunches on different events and uh, thereby not spending on the money on on food uh, to uh, to some very creative ways to attain finance. Uh, I, I must say that that person always took a very good care of uncle. So everyone is happy with, with that person. Uh, and now very successful company, that person is still major 80% owner. That's a, that's a great case because normally you would not, with other sources of finance, you would not retain that. Um, you build personal relationships, so you build synergies. Maybe that uncle not only has apples, but something else you can use. Some great expertise in, uh, in designing labels for your marmalade. But there are pitfalls also. By bootstrapping in semi-ethical way, by not giving back at least in some, in some way to, to the community that you draw resources from. You compromise your legitimacy, you compromise the opportunities for neighboring companies to, to use the resources. Uh, it's also quite slow way to grow. Yes, so scalability, scalability of your company can be also compromised if you only rely on resources at hand. Uh, and there can be, of course, uh, dependency challenges, even if, even if, um, there is no formal agreement that I need to give back. There might be. I've seen cases where there were actually uh, uh, um, ownership know-how claims in the end when the company used um, an expert, um, an expert in the field to do some work uh, without paying that person and um, for a very prolonged time and they used the result. It was kind of acceptable, but then uh, the, the, the person claimed um, actually protected the, the designs that, that the person did for the company, which was very costly in the long run. Uh, so that was bootstrapping. Take a couple of minutes. We will not going to do if you have some immediate reflections that you would like to share or you would like me to comment on, you can throw them in the chat now. No, we had two more sources. We had resources at hand. We had debt financing and equity, right? So we should give some attention to them. And we have a fair amount of time, 23 minutes. Uh, ah, yeah, ah, yeah, this is something I really love. <laughs> Uh, avoiding the pitfalls, those pitfalls that we just mentioned, legitimacy, scalability, dependency, they will always be there. They will always be hanging out there. You cannot completely avoid them. You can manage them smartly. Uh, so thinking slow, perhaps some of you 
or many of you have heard of this concept or perhaps read the book. If you didn't, uh, at least Google it and read some summary because it's absolutely genius. Uh, and it's quite connected to the second point, to the two marshmallows. Two marshmallows is um, quite an ethical <laughs> experiment on the preschoolers, on little kids, uh, that psychologists uh, somewhere in the US uh, done in the 60s. Uh, you put a kid in a room and uh, give uh, him or her um, a marshmallow, one, and say, okay, now I go out. Uh, if when I come back, if you did not eat up that marshmallow, I will give you two. Um, what happens to the kid at that point? The kid doesn't know if that adult tells the truth. Uh, if um, when, when the adult comes back, will it really be too marshmallow? And that marshmallow that is in front of the kid is so extremely attractive. It, it becomes almost like a survival mechanism. I take it now. I don't care what happens later. Uh, so that was the experiment. There were some kids that actually waited for the second one and somehow they traced also in the 20, 30 years that those kids who waited, they were generally more successful in lives, in the careers and all that. Uh, so let's skip for ourselves. We are not kids, we're not preschoolers. We're quite smart people here with our experiences, with our ways of uh, reasoning. Let's skip the part of the experiment, but just think that, you know, the second marshmallow might be coming, has very high probability if I'm thinking slow, if I'm thinking ahead. And not uh, driven by instinct of self-preservation, but, um, by long-term thinking. Yeah, I got, I got a question here from, uh, from Milo. Bootstrapping is great, but as you said, it slows your scalability. In our case, I'm still the only one working full-time and I can't wait that other co-founders and teammates join me from full-time, absolutely. I can say, um, and this is actually a very interesting insight from a Kaufman Research Foundation. That's uh, one of the iconic entrepreneurs of our time, right? Uh, where uh, it's a quite famous quote uh, saying, you continue to bootstrap until the bootstrapping outlives its utility, its usefulness. And at some point it becomes an inverse U curve, you bootstrap here, you bootstrap here, you bootstrap here, it has a lot of utility and actually external actors also appreciate it. They see that you're taking risks, they see that you're investing, but somewhere it halts, becomes very unproductive for your firm. And then it starts going down. You should stop us, you should be very careful sensing that point. It's very individual for every company, but when you can, stop and think and evaluate, uh, stop and think slow <laughs> about the second marshmallow and see, well, maybe this is now making, doing more harm. Then I'm not saying that you are going to be able to just go out and raise capital immediately, but you should start thinking on doing something else than bootstrapping. I've done a lot of mistakes with my company uh, by relying on bootstrapping for too long. And here we will come, uh, here we will come next on debt financing and you will see that it's not necessarily going to the banks, uh, which might be quite, quite difficult, quite challenging. Uh, there are other ways to, uh, to take on the debt. Uh, do not ask mom. Um, let's see, be critical, be critical and involve critical stakeholders. Probably uh, if you ask your mom, your best friend, maybe your uncle, if you have that very dear close relationship, uh, said, oh, that's, uh, you are doing everything great. Uh, be ready to, uh, to, get, to get a slap and ask, always ask for critical perspective. Am I doing this right? Use your network, use your, if you're part of an incubator, uh, use more experienced people to really challenge your way of doing things. 
Yes, debt financing, very quickly now. This is very obvious, right? It's banks and credit institutions where we know. It's a stakeholders conditional loan. I am letting in Angela. Yes. Uh, stakeholders conditional contributions, conditional stock lending. It's a certain kinds of crowdfunding where you can get lending from peers. And I would say that the lower you go, so banks and credit institutions that are your traditional, traditional way to take on debt and stakeholders and crowdfunding, that is more of a bootstrapping, borderline bootstrapping way to take on debt. Here you see that uh, some notes, your personal loan, if you go and mortgage your house, that is pure bootstrapping. That is not uh, debt financing because you are risking. Uh, you're putting in your own money, essentially. Uh, on second note, on the stakeholders, see that stakeholders are not the same as shareholders. Shareholders are essentially your co-owners. Co shareholders will have as much interest in your uh, business succeeding, as much direct interest as you personally have. Whereas stakeholders, that's a bit different. They might, uh, you might, might need to work harder to convince them that it is interesting for them to, uh, to lend you money. Uh, and the crowdfunding, uh, fools, friends and family, it's not the same as peer lending. Peer lending, because still peer lending, uh, crowdfunding is a formalized form of debt taking. Uh, so you will still have some legal responsibility there, whereas in uh, fools, friends and family, you would probably only have the social obligation, like the need to reciprocate to the uncle. Um, here are some, uh, some uh, sources that you would go for, for credit and mortgage. That's a big, big established sources. Look at the banks. There is a, yeah, this SCB is actually uh, like I cannot I cannot really spell it out because it's completely in Swedish. But it's like um, one of the biggest uh, Scandinavian banks here in Sweden. They have greenhouse program, which is a program of lending money on the preferential conditions to startups. So maybe you have local banks who are ready. To, to ease the burden a little bit. It can be so, it can be so that they only offer preferential conditions for some time. I've seen cases here in Sweden uh, where you would, exam for example, be allowed to not repay on the debt, but only on the interest for the first couple of years. But then use with caution because the money costs a lot. The money from institutional uh, lenders cost a lot. They are uh, they are not kind investors. They are for profit investors, or not investors, lenders in this case, lenders. So here are some advantages and disadvantages. Um, Yes, you can uh, look through them. We touched upon them a little bit. You can look through them later when you get slides. Conditional, this, is, this might be interesting because this might be something that you did not think about. Conditional lending by uh, stakeholders. Hmm? There might be companies that are generally interested in your business. They are not lenders. They are not institutionalized lenders but they might be interested in lending you services because uh, they want, either they want to have you as a client in the long run because they see potential, or maybe they want to uh, act as investment and investor in the long run. Uh, in Sweden here, we were approached and approached uh, ourselves um, a couple of uh, big consultancy companies that have offers like, uh, okay, for, for, for first year, for one year, we write an agreement for one year, uh, we offer you accounting for free. That's, that's essentially a loan as well. 
because from the second year, if you at, uh, attain certain milestones, you start selling, you get a turnover, then you must buy services from us. You cannot go to the competitor, even if they offer cheaper prices. So look at these big consultancy companies, Ving, yeah? What I um, pasted there below is, is local, it's Swedish. Well, it's quite big, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't think it's available in Balkans. It's a legal firm. And legal services here in Sweden, they are ridiculously priced. Uh, you might need to pay like 300 euros per hour for, for a legal expert that will help you write, uh, write a contract. Uh, so Vinya offers, uh, they have a startup program where they do offer some limited number of hours for free, which saves a lot of money, uh, but they want to pay back when you achieve um, certain milestones in development. Uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, yes. You, uh, what, what is here, what is here I would like to, on the advantages side, you see legitimacy for big money. Essentially, the more, you remember the pecking order, right? The finances at hand, debt, equity. Uh, the more successful you are on the steps, the more legitimate you become to the stakeholders at the next step. If the venture capital firm sees that you bootstrapped successfully, you managed to pull off a lot on your own uh, hand without support. If that venture capitalist sees that you managed to involve, attract some strong lenders, you have much better chances to get that venture capital firm interested. Uh, crowdfunding for uh, lending, peer-to-peer -peer lending. Uh, check if you have um, if you have those applications available in Balkans. Perhaps you, you've already checked. Uh, this is a borderline lending, borderline bootstrapping. I would say if you do not, if the if the bank loan is too costly for you, or if you don't have the right stakeholders who would lend you um, conditionally, uh, crowdfunding is a way to go. Uh, the thing with crowdfunding, you have to really be a salesman to crowdfund successfully. You have to really be that charismatic personality that is um, interesting for the crowd. We have actually one, it just, it just a second, I will take a question, I see the question. Uh, but just like I remembered now, we have a case here. I don't know if I should. Uh, it was internationally actually famous, a company from Lund that crowdfunded for debt and for equity extensively. It was a, comp a company developing uh, uh, a smart, a smart mobility, uh, not mobility, a vehicle, electric vehicle for, for, for cities, very small car that is uh, environmental and looking very cool and all that. Uh, for many years, very successfully crowdfunding, attracted so much financing uh, and never delivered. And now they're in very difficult position. They're being uh, legally prosecuted and all that and going through um, quite costly and uh, quite nasty uh, bankruptcy twists. But what I wanted to say here, you need to be a real salesman. The founder of that company, he was like a messiah. He was a really, really, really charismatic leader. Uh, you would um, come to his uh, presentations, you would be converted, completely sold on the idea. So that's the cost of crowdfunding. Yeah, it's, not, it's not for everyone either. Yes, uh, Annie, it's not only that bank loan is costly, but also if you are qualified to get one exactly, exactly. That's, uh, that's the thing also. And in different countries, there is different tolerance threshold at institutional lenders for what is qualified and what is not qualified. But of course, you need to be legitimate enough and you need to have enough collateral to, to go there. That's why you often do not go there at the first hand. Oh, one of the reasons, of course, also because that, that kind of money is usually quite costly. Thank you for this comment, absolutely true. Uh, crown lens, oh my God, I'm starting to, sorry. Mm, another questions too. 
I think uh, it's Ani as well. I think that startups should have a specific designed package, not only for loans, but the full, yes, absolutely. And that is important point to see what else do you get? You should preferably not be after money only. We were in, in the light, lighting company business, by the way, I have to brag a little bit, we did sell. Uh, this lighting company to a large Norwegian company last 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 winter, beginning of 2020. Uh, and it was quite slow thinking, so long-term thinking on our side that we involved them on quite quite early stage. Uh, first to do a joint, it's a lighting company, so it's company in the same industry. First to do joint um, test projects, then to lend us some money, then to uh, ah, more and more and more until they were actually um, ready to, to acquire the company. It was not the deal from the beginning, but it naturally evolved. So what I'm saying, see to that you involve the right stakeholders, not just any money, but something that someone who could offer you package synergy mm, yes equity financing that is something that you should be particularly careful about because here the package thing becomes extremely important you are losing a lot of uh control if you are involving uh, equity too early in the process and if you are involving equity just for the money's sake, without thinking what does that investor bring to the table except for pure money. Um, I'm checking the time, we only have six minutes. So uh, feel free to just like drop a lot of questions right now because uh, we might not have time specifically for that. If I see questions, I will stop and take them. Uh, Yes, business angels, business angels, they are essentially kind individuals. They are those uncles, but you don't have, you usually don't have personal connection with them. You only like find them through networks, look for people that are wealthy individuals in your area who might consider sharing some risk just for the sake of being able to say, few years later like ah i've contributed to this guy's success they usually won't give you a lot of money we had in in the lighting business that i now uh, mentioned too many times uh we've had local investors uh which is it's very cute uh, a few guys uh, wealthy individuals uh called uh projects their their own um set up they called i love lund which lund is a city so there are a group of angel investment investors very small group uh, that is called i love lund and they only invest in lund companies and they really like to uh, just you know go around take coffee with their entrepreneurs and take <laughs> selfies <laughs> uh, so they take really pride in contributing to the local community so it might be a good uh, good idea to look for those individuals if you if you want to start with equity of course they don't just give you money they want some share uh, in the business formally uh, yes some types of crowdfunding can also be considered crowdfunding for equity uh, what I mentioned now, industry actors, what I mentioned in my case, uh, some market players in your industry might be interested in acquiring a very, very small share. And even if they offer you very, very insignificant amount of money and you think it's not worth it, consider it because in the long run, this might be a good exit for you. This might be the way to, uh, uh, to make this, uh, this actor interested in acquiring you later. Um, yes, some actors that, uh, that uh, yeah, here, here is an I love Lund, I put them in to illustrate that you should look for uh, in very close proximity in your local community, some, uh, you know, uh, an owner of the hotel in your city or something like this, something, something very obvious. They usually have, uh, or not usually, but 
sometimes they do have uh, some interest on the side when they bought already all their uh, Lamborghinis and all their yachts and they uh, they hate their kids so they don't want kids to inherit anything <laughs> then they have some money that they could invest in you some little money um, yes advantages and pitfalls uh, this is actually this is actually it there are a couple two slides I wanted to once again encourage you to approach raising finance strategically it's not necessarily that the lowest hanging fruit is the best one or appropriate for you just at this point. Mm. And in the beginning, I mentioned that it could, it's good to, when, when one has these kinds of workshops, it's good to have post-it notes in hand and just like brainstorm and write different things. And then you would have ideally uh, some kind of um, organized way to 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 uh, think about your resources you could have columns with the um, with the uh, oh my god I, sh I i'm really trying to avoid saying swedish words <laughs> uh, to think about your part part goals um so you can have some columns and you can move your post-it notes between them uh depending on what's working what's not and then you can also or you should i would encourage you to have an action plan that is very 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 concrete very concrete a lot of entrepreneurs disregard that when i just joined the scene here in lund I was also like, no, 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 no. I will not be spending time on writing 40 pages business plan. And actually I do think that you should not spend time on writing 40 pages business plan, but some simple, lean, agile ways to, to, to track, uh, to test, uh, to see what you have done and what worked, what didn't work can, can bring you a tremendous learning. Uh, I think this is it. There is a link. Um, I will convert my presentation into PDF for those who want. So probably the link will not work from a PDF, but just copy the uh, the name and put it in the YouTube. It's just a three minutes video. It's um, it's fantastic. I think it's uh, about uh, investment, the first investment into the Alibaba, or well, not the first investment, but uh, the one that really made them take off. And the investor. Uh, this uh, wealthy individual that that put this money in, he explains why he did that, uh, and it's very interesting. He basically says in the end he had he had a passion in his eyes. Um, so, yes, some some seed of thought there. Um, yes, I'm done. I don't know. We do not have. It's exactly two thirty. So I hope you managed to ask the most critical questions in in the process. Um, yes, Thank you, Tanya. I'm done. Uh, we're still open for any questions that the attendees might have during the time. Mm -hmm. So. As informed, the participants will, in the end, will have their certificate of participation. However, what is most importantly is that I hope they got the best out of this training, some information that might be helpful in their future. But since we are still here, we can have a kind of discussion with each other, interaction. How do I stop sharing? <laughs> um, okay, I do that. I do that. Okay, okay. perfect. <laughs> okay. So, I have a question here. Tell more. Tell more about venture capitalists' advantages versus disadvantages. Yes, venture capitalists. First of all, uh, this is I, I cannot say it uh, more with more certainty that it's it's not the best source to go for at first hand unless you're absolutely sure that. 
um, that it's worth it. So it's worth a try. Uh, it takes a lot of time. You have to be really prepared to pitch and every, uh, in, to each and every one. The, the thing with venture capitalists is that they are professional investors. They do not have interest. They have some portfolio diversification in one industry or another, but this is their line of business to invest and make money and make profits. And even though there is some tolerance, they realize that most of the investors will uh, investments uh, will not result in big profits. They are very, very critical judges and uh, it might cost you a lot of time. It must, might cost you a lot of effort. Uh, and uh, if you are lucky enough, you probably have to give up so much of your company at the early stage. So take it with caution. Um, Unless you are given an opportunity that is very, yes. Another thing, it's it's if you go for venture capital quite early in the process, I would advise advise that you combine it with some other source of finance that you then diversify diversify your financiers. We've had uh, uh, considered we never got venture capital actually, uh, but we've considered involving uh, a venture capital investment together for uh, with the European grant even even in this way it could work uh, but don't rely uh, solely i would say uh, or don't expect to um, to get that uh, soon enough and enough um, on on the on the attractive conditions enough because as i said they are professional uh, professional investors they are not necessarily good for your company in terms of expertise. They will put a person on your board that will not, that will only care about you uh, providing the hockey stick. And that can be quite, uh, quite destructive for a small firm. Hmm? Thank you. If there are no more questions, then I'd like to thank you all, the ones that stayed until the end. I really hope that you enjoyed this event and workshop. We tried to, to make a kind of a meetup for all the entrepreneurs in the uh, Western Balkan countries, also make a kind of comparison with a developed country like Sweden. Uh, we really hope that we got our, I mean, we achieved our objectives. And we're really happy for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a Thanks. pleasure. Thanks. Then, Thank you Tanya, for joining and congratulations on your graduation now. Then I wish you all the best and I really hope to see you again, all of you in other events. Thank you. Bye. Bye.